The base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Thursday. It's a Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. You can share your thoughts with us on Twitter at Soccer Down Here, via email, Soccer Down Here at Gmail, and on the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash Soccer Down Here. I should know this by now, but I, I'm, I, I keep trying to fool myself that it'll change. You know, but we're getting ready for the show, and, and, and it's all like, okay, we're going to you know, go live in three and two, and had a little <laughs> bit of a thing here on my end, getting the, the file up to load. That's fine. Tell, tell John to hold on. And when I say we're going live now, what happens? Rustling stuff around, moving the papers in front of the microphone. You know, <laughs> you've done this thing before a few times. Fishing for pins on metal, uh, metal grates. Yeah, I, I give up. I'm just going to like just say, yeah, we're live. Just go. Stuff. It's funny. Um, it's a crazy day after a gut punch of a night last night for Atlanta United 2. Uh, conceding a goal and stoppage time after a, a really good performance in the rain against Tampa Bay Rowdies. We'll, we'll get into that tonight. I would love to get your questions if you watched with us uh, last evening from the Fraction. Uh, one more game for the twos at home next Wednesday, and then they finish up on the road in Miami. Um, big day in the Copa Libertadores with the Argentine teams back in the competition tonight. Uh, there is a quadruple header, if you are so inclined, on Fanatis uh, on BN Sport, fntz.co slash soccer down here. That'll get you in. You can sign up for the free trial, and you can watch games starting at 4 o'clock uh, all the way through uh, the late game kicks off at 11, I believe. Um, either 11 or 10.30. It's a uh, long day of Copa Libertadores action, and yesterday was a day of madness in Copa Libertadores. Uh, Internacional with a late winner um, that deflected. You had the Venezuelan teams who haven't been playing lately have a really big day. Um, the Libertadores always brings the madness, and we'll see if it brings it today with the Argentine teams in. Uh, there is still a lot of back and forth between Boca Juniors and Libertad. Uh, Libertad, you might know, as Tito Vialba's current club in Paraguay. The Minister of Health in Paraguay allowed players who had not tested negative yet for Boca to come into the country. Uh, there was talk yesterday of Libertad's president saying, well, why don't you just take the test here? Why don't you just test before the test now? Test, you're here. Come on, go ahead and test. And I had no clue where things stand or, or what the posturing is at this point, but there's a lot of uh, ire going into that one, and it's going to continue as the rest of the day. Uh, we'll keep you posted on anything that pops up this morning from it. Um, no, we're not rained out. Uh, it's not storming, so we should be fine. Um, we'll see. It's a ton of rain. It was not a pleasant uh, walking of Gwen this morning <laughs> at no. all, and she did not want to go with the short route this time either. She wanted to get her full morning walk in and then maybe regretted it when she came back in and was sopping wet. But anyway, uh, I regretted it. I could tell, tell, tell her that much. That was for sure. Uh, where do you want to start, John? Uh, you want to start with uh, last night MLS and USL? Sure. I did not have Santiago Mosqueda on my fantasy team. No, nope, I don't think a lot of people did. When you score a couple goals, that, that means that you get a lot of points. I did not anticipate Colorado putting uh, giving up four to FC Dallas last night. Uh, I had Dallas winning, but I don't know what to think of Colorado anymore after their 5 0 win, and then they give up four here, and they've had some big score lines go against them. Um, Dallas is a, a weird one because they're, they're pretty inconsistent, but where they were struggling to get going when they restarted with the games against Nashville and they couldn't find goals, they're finding them now. And Santiago Mosquera is uh, a dangerous wide player, it's just taking some time to get going for this team. But if you can get him going on one side, Michael Barrios going on the other side, they're a tough team in the attack. I think they can concede. I think you can find goals on them. But Dallas won't be easy, and Atlanta United will be seeing them in less than a week. Um, Franco Hara did get you a goal, Ricky Ricardo, so that's not too bad. But Mosquera was the star with the hat trick. Shinya Shiki got one back for Colorado. 
The biggest surprise of the night was in Vancouver, where Montreal yeah. melted down completely. Um, if you haven't seen the red card that Rudy Camacho got, uh, just go back and watch the video. It, it's one of the most sad and pathetic things that I've seen in a while. Um, he, he punched a man in the knee, like kind of the knee. I guess he might he might have tried to. Well, hit him it was in the knee. like it was missed. like almost on the ligaments on the side. It wasn't even on the kneecap. He comes in from the side and he hits him in the ligaments. You're giving him a lot of credit. I, I think he missed. I think he had bad aim, sitting down and punching somebody in the knee. It 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 looked like a child. Um, it was a red card. It completely uh, derailed the game for Montreal. They needed to win, and then they would have been in the Canadian Championship final. Now they're not. They lose 3-1. Uh, they did pull one back to make it 2-1 and then gave up the third, and it was ball game. So Toronto goes into the Canadian Championship final. They will be playing the winner of the Canadian Premier League. And the, a, a spot in the CONCACAF Champions League next year is on the line. Montreal flat out blew it. There's just no other way around it. Um, shocking. Just absolutely shocking from Montreal. Freddie Montero was your superstar for Vancouver with a couple of goals. Uh, Romo Kyoto got one back for Montreal. My fantasy team was very happy about that. The uh, late game, San Jose and Portland finished 1-1. Uh, Vaco with a goal that did go over the line. Um, it was kind of a weird situation where it... it I couldn't tell in, in real time. It was close. The play continued. It was being reviewed. And when, I guess, the VAR, Fotis Pizakos, had the angle, and he's like, look, it's a goal. There's just no way around. It's a goal. The referee blew the whistle to stop the play. That had continued um, 20 seconds or so. Uh, the ball was at midfield. It wasn't in a threatening position, or it could have been dicey. So he blows the whistle. He goes run over to take a look at it real quick. The referee sees it, immediately <laughs> turns back around like, yep, good goal. And it's 1-1. It was kind of a weird moment. But they got it right in the end. It's just not often do you see the play stopped in the middle to go look at the VAR screen. This one was done correctly, and it's 1-1. And Fotis Pizakos helped San Jose out after he was in the middle and had some weird moments with Atlanta and San Jose back in 2018 in the uh, wild Five Stripes After Dark match. Yeah, and your trivia question on the flip side for uh, Vancouver and Montreal. Halifax and Forge FC will be playing on Saturday as Forge knocked off Cavalry FC, uh, the Calgary-based team. So it's the Halifax Wanderers and Forge FC to take on Toronto to determine that bid. All right. Um, I know nothing about either one of those teams. I'm sorry. I'm not up on the Canadian Premier League. I haven't been getting into it on FS2. I think you've been watching a little bit of it. Anything you want to say on them? Uh, I mean, it's, I'm looking at it more from the production standpoint, but if you're looking for Forge FC, obviously you're looking at a guy like Mo Babuli who scored the, the decider yeah, in the player. game against Cavalry. So uh, that would be the, the focus really there. Uh, the competition has been fairly even across the board. You've had a lot of low scoring games, a lot of even matches all the way. And it's a mistake here or there that, uh, flips it for for one team or the other so i mean it's uh i give the canadian premier league a lot of credit for doing the island games and i also give uh the league and one soccer a lot of credit for doing the virtual stadiums and we talked about this with mls's back and with other local games in mls that we've seen what since the league has returned to home sites so uh i give the cpl a lot of credit for hosting a tournament putting it together on uh, prince edward island the weather at times has been dicey where you've had 40 or 50 mile an hour winds that have kind of caused games not to be played immediately. And so they've kind of had to delay them a little bit, but uh, you know, kudos to the CPL for getting stuff down and uh, it's been played fairly consistently over the last month. uh, And they, they organized it and I give them full credit for getting to this point. All right, let's turn into a little bit of uh, Fabrizio Romano down here because if if you're not following him, you, you need to, he's the guy on European transfers. And he's incredibly accurate and plugged into what's going on. Um, his latest tweet is very interesting for U.S. men's national team fans. Bayern Munich, who has some money in the coffers now on the Tiago deal going to Liverpool. We'll talk about that in a second. Bayern Munich have now opened talks with Ajax for Serginho Dest, the first target uh, of Bayern. Hansi Flick wants him as uh, also Ronald Koeman. Um, Barcelona already contacted his agents. 
But Barcelona has to sell players before they can bring new players in. It's the same thing as the, the Memphis Depay situation. Uh, Semedo, who had the, the shocker of a match against Bayern, they're trying to get rid of him, bring in Dest. That's a pretty good spot for a U.S. men's national team player. Could be going to Bayern, could be going to Barca. Eh, you know, pretty good. Um, other reports had an offer from Bayern going to Ajax for $15 million that was turned down. Now it's talk that it could be 20 uh, the talk on the Tiago deal is 20 up front with up to another 10 in add-ons. I think five is, is pretty easily accomplished from what I've seen. The The Dest move to Bayern seems more likely than Barca, um, as, as Alas, the president of Lyon, came out and put Barcelona's business on the street and said, yeah, I talked to somebody, and yeah, they don't have any money. They're really struggling. So uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to get Memphis to pie done or anything. Just putting it out there like that. So I don't see Barcelona getting Dest. I see Bayern being the ones who can do it, and they have the money to spend now. Uh, big stuff. Um, Chris Ashley's trying to start something here. Oh. And uh, there's no Yedlin to Atlanta rumors, first off. Let's, let's make sure we're, we're talking about things in the correct way. Uh, I have not seen it. If I have missed it, please share it with me. I have not seen a direct DeAndre Yedlin to Atlanta rumor. I have seen DeAndre Yedlin to MLS. I have seen DeAndre Yedlin out of Newcastle. Um, I have heard the conversations about Cincinnati's allocation spot, um, which they have, and they are trying to ship. Um, Chris Ashley's starting rumors. I wanted to clarify, and I wanted to throw the correct (laughs) blame where it needs to be thrown. Chris Ashley, I'm blaming you. There's no rumor of this. We have to be clear, because sometimes people use their platforms to start things that are just not accurate. So we're going to push back on what? That. Yeah, it happens a lot. It's been happening a lot. I've seen it a lot, especially lately. Anyway, um, DeAndre Yedlin to MLS. Yeah, it makes sense. You're going to have to pay him. Uh, he's probably going to be a designated player. Probably. Oh, I, I saw the tweet, Chris Ashley. I saw it. It was somebody speculating that it would be a wild possibility for Yedlin to be in Atlanta. That is not a rumor. There are differences in our That's terminology. That's like a two-step here. rumor. That's it's like not a rumor. No, it's not even. It doesn't even qualify as a rumor. It, it is speculation. It Subjection. is a wish list. It is like me putting. I would like all these different things on my Amazon wish list, and then putting it out there into the universe and hoping somebody buys it for me. That's what that would be. That's not even a rumor. It doesn't make sense. You, you have Brooklyn and you have Franco Escobar on the right side. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are teams who could use him. But do they have spots to spend on him? And, and that's going to be the thing, because he's going to have to be a designated player. I just don't see any other way around it. Um, I don't know if he ends up in MLS this time around. Uh, Newcastle, I think, will find somewhere else for him to go. I don't think it'll be MLS. I just don't know if anybody in MLS will be able to commit the dollars that he's going to require to get it done. That's just my thought. Um <laughs> Which oh now we're starting Calvin Phillips to Atlanta. Chris Ashley starting rumors. You're gonna yes, have to block all, Chris all of Ashley. Leeds United to Atlanta. Yeah, you're gonna have to block Chris Ashley so you don't get confused with his starting of rumors. Um, don't block him really. Just maybe mute him from time to time. I'm just kidding. Uh, on Leeds game days, you might want to. In yeah, Greenville yeah, Triumph Leeds game days, game days you might days need and, to. And uh, he's on the clock for his Greenville Triumph interview this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, uh, lots of stuff. Just don't go spreading rumors on that Greenville Triumph day, weekly show. Come on, come on. Anyway, um, Bern Dersberger says Yedlin would be a big downgrade from Escobar. Big, I don't know, but I would agree. I would agree. Um, I'm not convinced he would be worth the amount of money it would take to pay over Lennon, to be perfectly honest, because you're talking about two very wildly different price amounts in a salary cap league, and I don't know if the performance is that wildly different. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. I don't think he's here in Atlanta. I don't think he's here in MLS, to be honest. I just don't know if anybody's going to commit the dollars to him at, at this point in Major League Soccer. Uh, back to Romano and rumors down here. And Fabrizio Romano's a step beyond just your general rumor monger. He starts to report on things as they're happening. He had the Tiago stuff as it was building up. Uh, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge has confirmed it two hours ago. Uh, it's, it's done. Um, Tiago's going to Liverpool, which was a move that we kind of wondered. I am not a monger ragamuffin. Um, Tiago to Liverpool is a weird one. And I know Nathan Pugh had a tweet about it as well, if you can pull that up. So we're staying on topic here. Um, 
I wondered if it would go down because does Liverpool really need him? They have the money to spend because they are they are not a plucky upstart. They have cash. Um, and they decided to spend it on Thiago, who's an amazing player. Is it going to change the way Liverpool wants to play even further? Uh, it, I think it's going to have to, to get the best out of Thiago. How much? And it'll be interesting to see if it fits, because sometimes you see these moves where you go get a player that is very good, you bring him in, you think your team's going to get even better, but the fit doesn't quite work. Burns says he thinks it doesn't work out well. I'm skeptical, definitely. Uh, I want to see how the minutes get divided up in that midfield, and I want to see how the team plays with Tiago. I know Nathan Pugh, our resident Liverpool fan, thinks it will work because it's red, right? Yes, yes. That's what I thought. Uh, Paul Joyce says he's going to sign a four-year deal, wear the number six jersey. Nathan's comment, basically, uh, it's two steps. He says that, Tiago, come on, lads. Uh, come on, lad. Up the Reds, John, that is all. And then uh, he does the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't know what movie it's in, but where he's, he bites his finger in, out of ecstasy. Uh, that's Wolf of, of Wall Street. Okay, so Wolf of Wall Street. So he posted that. It's a very so gifable movie, uh, Wolf of yeah. Wall Street. And then uh, also he says it also allows Fabinho to drop and into a center back in a pinch if necessary. Yeah, I, we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm still skeptical. Um, I'm still somewhat skeptical. I, I know we haven't even gotten to all the, the Fabrizio Romano rumors because there's so many. Dude has been busy lately. So, all right. This is we're, we're going to scroll backwards. We've got the Serginio <laughs> Dest okay. one to, to be on the lookout for. Bayern Munich and Barcelona chasing him. Barcelona has to sell somebody to be able to have the room for him. Karl Heinz Rummenigge confirming Thiago to Liverpool. Uh, signed a contract through June of 24, 100%. It is in the here we go stage. And as you follow Fabrizio, you'll, you'll understand how the terminologies work. Uh, Gareth Bale is going to go to Tottenham, and it looks like he will be in London tomorrow. Uh, It is at the here-we-go stage. Uh, Last details about the salary, which it sounds like Tottenham is going to pay outright. Um, It is going to be a one-year loan, so he will remain a Real Madrid player. Um, He'll complete the medicals, do the deal. Uh, Mourinho has approved it. They're also bringing in uh, Regulon um, outside back. Tottenham and Real Madrid doing lots of business here, but Tottenham, and this was a a lot of back and forth, according to most people, how much of the salary were they going to pay? It sounds like they're going to pay the whole thing. Um, If Real Madrid gets (laughs) Bale out of town and gets all the money covered in his salary, that's some pretty amazing business from Real Madrid. Uh, and now we'll see if Gareth Bale is motivated, and you know if he isn't, uh, Jose Mourinho might strangle him on All or Nothing Tottenham Hotspur <laughs> season two. Oh, that'd be awesome! No, I don't want to see anybody die. That's not good. No, but just uh, having that on video is what I'm saying. It's just not to awesome to watch moment. somebody die on video. Uh, apparently, Mourinho Bale was filmed man. arriving at the uh, Valdebebas training ground, so he's uh, going to have his medical done there. And according to uh, the Daily Mail and Max Winters, part of the move will be financed by Real Madrid. And uh, apparently... When is is that from? It is from uh, very early this morning, updated five minutes ago. Okay, because I've seen back and forth on how much of the deal is being paid for by Tottenham. The majority of the reports I've been seeing are that they're taking his salary on. But we'll, we'll see what it ends up finalizing at. A uh, $13 million loan, apparently, from uh, Tottenham to get it to, to get it all done. Uh, 56 goals, 58 assists, 203 appearances before leaving Real for the world record fee at the time of £86 million in 2013. So they are, according, this is Max Winter, right? Yeah. So they are paying $13 million in the loan and paying the salary? I'm or they're paying the thirteen article. million and then not paying all the salary, which I mean, then why aren't you just? I, I, let's wait and see how this gets worked out because there there could be some funny business with how the money works. Um, in terms of is there a loan fee or, or is there just the entire salary being paid? We'll see. That's probably the the final things to work out. Is just 
yes, this is the money we're talking about. Now, how do we divide it up on paper? We'll, yeah. we'll see what, how it goes down. But he's headed to London tomorrow. Uh, madness. I mean, it, it is craziness. So you've got a lot of things moving in Europe. You also have other things moving in Europe below this level. And you have the EFL president. Uh, not exactly painting a rosy picture of the, the situation below the Premier League. Rick Perry says it's not inevitable that clubs will fold, but he said a financial solution is needed quickly to keep every single one of them alive. That sounds like you're mincing words, and I don't know why. Um, he said that, the, one, they're trying to get money from the Premier League. Uh, they have reportedly requested around £200 million pounds from the Premier League. They are talking to other parties um, as well, trying to find money. So they, we haven't put all of our eggs in one basket. Our message is clear. The amounts that we need have been spelled out with clarity and with simplicity, but we need solutions really very quickly. This isn't a matter of months away. This is a matter of we need solutions in the next few weeks. Uh, we do need rescue packages, and we're hoping that by securing rescue packages, we can secure the future of our clubs. Our aim is to keep every single one of them alive, if at all possible. Um, EFL clubs collectively are hemorrhaging 25 million pounds a month. Rescue packages are urgently needed. They're trying to get some people in the stands uh, to help deal with that. Uh, one club that they probably won't be able to save is Wigan. It's not looking good, even after that fundraising campaign. They can't find a buyer. Uh, they are asking about £3.3 million pounds for Wigan, the uh, the administrators. Uh, it's priced as a package. It will include the stadium, the team, the training ground, whole thing. Nobody's beaten down the door. Uh, they said that's the lowest price possible to allow sufficient funds to pay the remaining creditors. If they can't do that, if somebody buys it but doesn't pay off the remaining creditors, there's a further 15-point deduction. Um, the, the administrator said most buyers would obviously want to avoid that, but if anyone out there is willing to take a 15-point penalty, we could probably do a deal for just north of £2 million. Pounds. That's definitely cheap when you consider the club still has a few players who might be worth that much. Um, then you have people protesting Wigan's transfer sales that they've done to stay afloat, which is yeah. ridiculous. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, if you're a huge Wigan fan, uh, I don't know what to tell you. The club's about to go under. <laughs> They're selling players to keep the doors open. So, yes, you, you might want to keep some of these players. You can't. You don't have that option. You've got to sell whatever you can sell. It's just flat out the case. There's, there's no other way around it. So if that means you have to sell Anthony Robinson, which he had a clause in his contract to be able to be sold for at least $1.9 million uh, if the club was relegated, and you got $2 million for him, okay, cool, you got a little bit of extra cash, but you didn't have a choice. No choice. So you got to sell players. Um, the flip side is you're not going to finish the season. <laughs> like, period. That's what's going to happen. Or you're not going to be around, period. Uh, well, that's not finishing the season is that. I'm not even saying you're not going to be around after you finish the season. You're not going to finish the season. You're going to go under. Yeah. You're going to go out of business. The doors are going to shut, and you're not going to p finish the schedule. That's what's going to happen, and that's what's going to happen with other teams. So, yeah, um, Rick Perry should not be saying it's not inevitable that clubs will fold. He should be saying that if there's not money coming in, clubs will fold. Mm -hmm. don't, don't piecemeal this. Like, Be real about it, because that's, that's the, the conversation. So you've got, on this one side... The plucky upstarts uh, of Liverpool dropping thirty million for Thiago, twenty plus add-ons. You've got Tottenham taking on Gareth Bale's ridiculous contract and maybe paying money for to, for the privilege to do it. And then you've got clubs that are going to go under. <laughs> like that's it, it's so hard to navigate all of this. What the effects of the coronavirus are going to be on the game across the board. Because it's going to be huge um, in a lot of different ways. The big clubs are going to be big. The medium clubs could go either way. The bottom clubs are going to fail. I mean, there, there's just no other way around it. So stay tuned. Um, there's going to be more big sales, I think. Not any. I don't think Lataro is going to go here. Sancho's not going to go. So I think the biggest moves are done. Um, you will have... Potentially Luis Suarez going to Italy. That might be back on as I have read rumors that he is headed to Italy. 
to take uh, one of his tests to try to get his citizenship so he doesn't count as a foreign player. Juventus won't take him if he does. Um, maybe there's going to be a way around that if he's been studying his Italian language skills. We'll find out. Um, you could have some other moves from Barcelona because they're trying to bring players in, and they can't unless they move players out. But you're in the 10 to 40 kind of range now in terms of, of sales. The the big names that we thought would move, I think those times are done. You're also going to see some two and threes and fours and fives of clubs who have to sell to try to ensure they finish the year. Um, I do think with the window closing in, what, a couple of weeks, I think you're going to get down to the wire and some clubs are going to be looking at the bottom line. And we're talking some, you know, League One type of teams, some championship teams probably. League Two, if they have anybody who has any kind of real value, they're probably going to have to sell. Because if you don't know when fans are coming in, and there's not a major TV check that's coming on a monthly basis, this will be your last chance to bring in revenue. And yeah, it stinks if you have to sell a great player. There's no other way around it. But it might be the last chance for big revenue. And it could fund your season. So if, you've, if you're a League 2 team, a League 1 team, a second division team in any other country and you're looking at the possibility of no revenue coming in for months and months and months, you might have to make a sale you don't want to because that might be your last chance to keep your club moving along and and stay afloat. And also, you mentioned Wigan. There's a team that was relegated out of League 2 last year, Macclesfield Town. They've been given a half a a million pound winding up order. Basically, that means you've got a week to challenge that this is the amount of money that you owe – and if you don't challenge it and you don't pay it, then you will disappear. And so that's where Macclesfield Town is right now. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's no way around it. Um, it's, I don't know. I got nothing. Uh, Burn says total transfer spend uh, grows this window for the entire Bundesliga is down 75% from last summer. That's back to the level of 2008. And the German clubs will be, you know, probably the most fiscally responsible. So if they feel like they know what's coming, they're not going to spend anything. And Bayern wasn't going to spend anything until they sold. So they sell Tiago, so now they might go spend it on a player. And that's it. That's it. Um, We'll see. Uh, Forecard asked about a no-confidence vote on Bartomeu. The amount of signatures that they needed to force that through was acquired. So they they met the deadline. Uh, Now they have to, I think, confirm the signatures, and then it goes to a vote of the membership. Um, And if two-thirds vote no confidence on Bartomeu, the election will be moved up from March of next year. So, I mean, it could be moved up for a few months. It's not going to be a massive change, but it'll be a big distraction for Barcelona in the season. If that thing gets moved up to November, I don't know what the, the timeline of this process is. That get moved moved up to you know November October. <laughs> I'd hate to be Ronald Koeman right about now. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if they can make any moves too. I mean, it, it, that's the other thing. If Bartomeu is able to to swing some moves and bring in some players that excite the fan base, that might help him in this vote to stay in his role until March, until that you know, election where he can't re, he can't run again. He, he's he's term limited, so uh, he's leaving no matter what. But he might be leaving a little bit sooner unless he makes some deals that make people happy. Uh, signatures first need to be verified within 10 days. Then a poll will be held among the 150,000 members. At least two-thirds of the votes needed to be cast against Bartomeu to ensure the, that his reign is brought to an end. Uh, while Chara brought some news into the Twitch pitch, uh, Doug Robertson tweeted a little bit ago, uh, media that cover Atlanta United were supposed to get to talk to Barco yesterday. At last minute, he couldn't. Today, we hope to talk to Barco. He's not on the list. So, sorry, folks. I, I have no idea what the process is. While Chara asks, is he looking to leave this window? Haven't heard any other rumors for a while, to be perfectly honest. Um, haven't heard anything out of Sevilla or Fiorentina since that flurry of reports so I don't know. Again, you are getting a couple of weeks away from the window in Europe. So if teams are going to make a move now, it needs to start moving. Um, the motion would have to start happening. There has not been a report that anything is in motion um, since Sevilla 
was reportedly interested. So I don't know. I'm not sure what the situation is. Um, don't I, And I don't know Barco's personal schedule either. I don't know if he has a doctor's appointment. I don't know what's going on. Uh, he was a last-minute scratch from yesterday, and he was not scheduled to talk to today. He was scheduled to talk yesterday. So I I don't know the situation. Um, we'll see. Um, he Abby says he's working his butt off to increase his value. He is. Uh, Ezekiel Barco's playing hard, and he is taking a pounding getting fouled a ton but he is trying to make things happen it was a beautiful free kick against nashville that helped equalize uh might have found the back of the net if if jeff's red locks didn't touch it because i don't think he got much else on it i think just Mm -hmm. the the hair brushed it uh it was a great free kick from barco um he's playing well and he's playing hard and he's a player who will succeed in europe there's no doubt in my mind on that He's a very talented player, and like I said about Pitti Martinez, I think Ezekiel Barco will be the same thing. He's going to be appreciated more here when he's gone, in my opinion. Um, I don't think he's ever been truly embraced, and some of that's down to injuries, to be honest, and that's not his fault. He's had bad luck with a variety of different injuries, and it's it's not been one thing. I don't think it's an injury-prone situation, but he hasn't played a ton as much as you would have hoped, but I think he will net money back for the club, and I think he'll move on to a, a, a big club. I mean, Sevilla is a Europa League champion that was reportedly interested. Fiorentina is trying to become a big club in Italy. Those would be good spots for him. I think both would work out really well. Um, either one would be a perfect fit for him. Yeah, and we'll just keep an eye on that uh, situation. Both uh, clubs that are interested, obviously, you know, we'll talk about that on a daily basis, but uh, Barco is working his blank off uh, to help out Atlanta United these days. Yep, uh, Atlanta plays third or plays uh, Saturday. Um, Miami come into town. We'll be on radio at six thirty for the Five Stripes countdown. Uh, kickoff will be just after seven in a closed door Mercedes Benz Stadium. Um, there was some talk with the Bundesliga launching back on Friday. I think there's going to be fans in some places, and I'm not sure how many are going to be uh, with fans. There was hope that the opener would have fans it will not uh Derek Ray tweeted that out earlier this morning from German reports uh Bayern and Schalke will be a closed door match there was a previous decision to allow 7,500 people city of Munich has reversed it there's been an uptick in COVID-19 cases the mayor spoke of not wanting to send the wrong signal and they will not have fans uh as Derek pointed out as well, and he consistently does, if you're looking for more information, make sure you're following uh, the lead commentator for matches on the ESPN over-the-air broadcasts of the Bundesliga. Derek Ray will be on the call for those. Uh, Derek will also be involved in ESPN FC. But as Derek points out, and as Bern points out in our Twitch pitch all the time, Germany is a, a very decentralized country so where and we saw it with uh dynamo dresden in the initial phase of testing where they had to go into a quarantine where no other team did the states the local governments will have the power in this so the 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 federal government will issue a guideline and the mayor of munich says no not doing it and that's the way it's going to be so you will have some games that will have some fans, I believe, this weekend, and you'll have others that don't. The opener tomorrow uh, with Bayern will not have fans. Yeah, and it, it's it's really cool when Derek finally announced that he was going to, because he had been teasing something that was coming down the pipeline. But it was really cool to see the announcement that he's going to be that linear voice for, for ESPN, someone who uh, has invested as much time as he has. And m- remember during... Uh, quarantine when he would do his backyard Bundesliga and he would show you, give you previews of whatever match you wanted the whole weekend. He'd take requests, that kind of stuff. Someone who's as invested as he is. It's really cool to see uh, him be a part of things at ESPN. Looking forward to seeing what the product looks like on the ESPN family of networks uh, in a linear sense. Uh, Burns says, I think there will be good crowds at all the other Bundesliga games, 20% of the capacity this weekend. Uh, We'll see if any others change their course. But, yeah, right now it looks like the others will have fans, Bayern, and will not because of an uptick in Munich, uh, which is an area that's had, I think, a harder hit just in general with everything throughout the pandemic. 
Uh, there's a lot of talk throughout Europe where you've got teams wanting to have fans. The EFL, we mentioned the financial trouble. They're trying to get 1,000 fans into games. But you're also starting to hear that they're, they're spread as people are getting back to normal activities. So I, I think you might see this back and forth sort of thing. Aberdeen had a test situation with fans in the building. Uh, one week, they're not doing that this week. So it's it's going to be tricky to navigate, but everybody wants to get fans back in the building because everybody wants to bring in that revenue because it's vital. Uh, but is it going to be safe in every place? Probably not. So how do you, how can you make it work? And that's what the game and, honestly, the world is trying to figure out right now. Uh, Wow Chara chimes in and says, uh, saw Adrian Healy's the voice of Austin. He's like Max Pretos for that club, it seems. And, yeah, that's a really good comparison. Um, It gives them, you know, instant credibility. If you've watched games on ESPN and you see Adrian Healy, you know, with an Austin shirt on, you're like, oh, wait a minute, he's our guy. Cool, awesome. It was the same for LAFC with Max. So that's that's a a good move. It's a bold move. And, you know, it depends on how much they incorporate him into everything that the club does. LAFC does a great job with, with Bretos, so we'll see if Austin does that with Healy. I would assume that they would. They've done everything else pretty well so far. Yeah, and uh, with that announcement came out yesterday. and uh, Austin has been hitting all the right notes so far when it comes to letting everybody see how things are going with the building of the stadium, with how they're being a part of the community, all of these different things getting their name out there, getting recognized as a part of MLS even before the stadium is complete and before they have played a match. When you're seeing uh, Adrian do his material in a hard hat, when you're seeing the the Minister of Culture doing his material for the league and having that kind of collective weight where uh, Matthew McConaughey is doing Q&As wearing uh, an Austin FC toque, but he is doing it shirtless. But still, you've got that kind of recognition and cachet that Austin is pushing forward here and uh, once again, you got a team that's hitting all the right notes so far, and Adrian Healy was definitely a good one uh, for their uh, voice when it comes to their TV product and all of their platforms. Uh, back to the Bundesliga stuff. It's a six-week trial with the 20% capacity, and that's subject to local approval, and, and Burns pretty positive on it working in most places. Uh, it's, it's a, I mean, it's an important step, and if they can get it right, then we will see. Um, Ricky Ricardo, and I have not jumped into this yet. I know they were unveiled yesterday. The FIFA 21 ratings. I like that they're becoming as big of a deal as the Madden ratings, where, where people get really bent out of shape about it. Ricky says, FIFA 21 already had gameplay issues, and I get it has a Euro-leaning feel, but some of the people left off these MLS top 10 player rankings is so, so strange. Nagby's not in the top 10 in MLS midfielders. That's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wow. kind of ridiculous. I mean, it depends on who all you're lumping into midfielders. Like, if you're lumping wingers that you could consider forwards into midfielders, maybe he gets bumped that way. I don't know what his rating is, so that's not good. Um, Miles isn't in there either. Miles never gets the respect that he deserves. Uh, I had a chance to play the, the beta a little bit on, on FIFA 21, and... I like where it's going. I hope that there were some improvements from, from what I played. Um, I, I liked it in terms that it felt as a, just the gameplay felt pretty realistic. Um, it felt more realistic than it has in the past. It didn't feel as, as arcade style. I want the more realistic style. Um, I liked some of the things they're working towards. It's I, Again, I had a beta, so I can't really make any big claims on it to say that you know, oh, it's 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 horrible. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed playing it. It was fun. Um, the way some of the the transfer negotiations and the development, I liked in the season how you could affect the the practices a little bit differently and, and develop players a little bit differently. That stuff was cool. Um, Ricky's right. EA doesn't have any real competition with all of the licenses that they have. Uh, Pro Evolution Soccer just doesn't really compete in the same way. And they need some competition to push to continue to get better because it it can get a little stale. Madden's went through that. Hopefully, FIFA can can bounce back from it. I want to play the finished product. I'll definitely get it. And maybe I'll have to yell about the MLS ratings a little bit once I get it. Uh, He was in the top five in dribbling attributes, so that's good at least. Uh, Nagby was. Um, Okay, so (laughs) Four Cards said... Do we know if the whole team saw the Tottenham All or Nothing? 
seemed like the whole time Jose was slash should be talking to Atlanta United players. Four card, I'd, I'd like to hear why you say that um, and what parts he was saying would be directed to the Atlanta United players. I want to see where you go with this. So I'm going to hold this conversation. I haven't watched the last episode yet that's available. Yeah, um, I've seen, I saw seven and eight and I didn't have enough time to see nine yesterday. Yeah, I haven't gotten to nine yet, but I'm, I'm with Katie. All or nothing has definitely changed my opinion on Jose Mourinho. No question. Um, and it was intended to. And it was designed to, and it's been edited to, and it's being produced to, and he knows there's a camera on him. I mean, it, yes, it is a production. There's no way around it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I like the way he is dealing with things in this. I like how he is dealing with the people around him in this. Um, Four card is just yelling all of it, just about the mentality <laughs> fighting. The the reason I'll push back on this because there was something very specific in it to me that. I thought carried over um, the fighting element. I'll push back on that part because Atlanta United's not rolling over in games. I don't see that at all. Are they getting tired? Yeah. hundred percent. Are they rolling over and quitting on games? No. One shot of Emerson Hindman not continuing a pointless run on Rodolfo Pizarro does not mean that this team is quitting. I want that to be clear because you've seen good second halves from this team pretty consistently. Problem is you've seen awful first halves and you've seen a lot of goals conceded in the first half. They're not quitting. The part that immediately jumped out to me, there's two elements to it, but they're kind of of the same, same thing. He talked at one point, he's talked consistently in the, in the season from last year at Tottenham when he took over about Tottenham being too nice. Mm -hmm. and needing to get nasty. And he talked about it very specifically in one moment about needing to foul, to break play up, needing to, to, to pick the right moments to foul. Transitions have been an issue for Atlanta United at times, and this goes back to last year as well. I think of the Real Salt Lake game where Frank DeBoer is screaming for somebody to commit a foul in midfield, and they yeah. didn't, and Real Salt Lake scored a winner uh, 20 seconds later. You have to know when to take that foul. And Atlanta doesn't always do it. And it's something in those moments of transition that has to happen. We talked about it a lot last night, probably because it's front of mind for me because of watching All or Nothing with Atlanta United 2. And I thought they did a very good job with fouling in those moments where they needed to, especially in the second half. It is an element of the game. And we talk about fouling a lot. We talk about fouls a lot with Atlanta United and how they get fouled a lot because teams know. You don't want to get them going. You don't want to allow them to string passes together. Foul. Break it up. Make them have to restart. Make them get frustrated. Atlanta needs to dish some of that out at times. Um, the, the problem is, and the hard part is, is it seems like at times the, the yellow cards get thrown differently, team to team. Then you just have to rotate it around. But you still have to commit those fouls in transition when you need to do it. That immediately jumped up, out to me. Um, four card wants an all-or-nothing MLS edition with Atlanta United. Uh, he said, I would love that kind of access. Teams generally don't love that kind of access. Yeah, uh, That's why at times it's hard to get teams to sign up for the, uh, the NFL one. Um, you don't want to give that stuff away if you're a team. Teams that do it generally do it for specific reasons. Uh, could Atlanta do it at some point? Sure. I'd love to see it in MLS. It's, it's great for those of us on the outside to be able to see it and, and get to feel everything inside. Um, it's great to have that look. Uh, Mezzano, you're being very negative. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. Right now, it's more nothing than all. Sorry, hard truth. <laughs> you were waiting for wow. that one, too, weren't you? Um, wow. It's a Thursday, y'all. Come on. Let's put smiles on our faces if we can. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to see it in MLS uh, because I think it'd do a, a good thing for growing the league. That's why Tottenham did it. It grows their brand. Uh, that's why mm -hmm. Manchester City did it. It grew their brand. Uh, that's why Leeds did it. It grows their brand. So MLS, it would grow the brand. I'd like to see it done in this way. Absolutely. This is all or nothing to me is the best one of these. Um, I love the Manchester City one because you got to see – behind the, the the wall with Pep. You know, now you're getting to see behind the wall with Jose. 
You got to see behind the wall of Bielsa. Those are all figures that you want to see more behind the scenes. Uh, in MLS, you know, I'd love to see one with Kansas City. I'd love to see Peter Vermees unfiltered. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'd be fascinating to me. Um, I'd like to see Greg Vanny unfiltered. I think Toronto would be a really good one because then you'd also be seeing you know Michael Bradley, Jose Jose Altador unfiltered. Those would be really interesting ones to me. Um, LAFC would be a great one, and the the ESPN series they did uh, had a during early 2018. It wasn't the same. It it felt too slick. Yeah. And that's the thing that All or Nothing, I think, has done really well. And you can probably speak on this more than me from a, a, a filmmaking perspective is it, it is slick, but it doesn't feel slick. The, right. the LAFC one on ESPN felt like a commercial. Yeah, it felt like a promo. Yeah, and this is a commercial for the team, but it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Now, with uh, the, the LAFC one, it... They were push. It seemed like they were pushing uh, their agenda out there. It's like, okay, here's what we want you to see. Where you're looking at all or nothing, and you're getting warts and all. I mean, you're getting players who are cussing. You got Eric Dyer who, and Eric Dyer explaining to his teammates what was going on in that situation when he stormed up into the stands. To get that kind of behind the scenes stuff, you weren't getting that with the LAS- LAFC version on ESPN. But when you have all of these cameras and all of this access and the treasure trove of everything that this crew had to put all or nothing together, to see all of those moments you remember, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that moment. And then you get the chance to pull back the curtain a little bit and take a deeper dive into the moment. You're hearing from uh, Yon Min's son about that run against Burnley and, and playing with the, the elbow that was fractured and finishing a match and getting all that stuff and all the behind-the-scenes stuff with Danny Rose and Jose Mourinho uh, going at each other in Jose's office. All of those things, that's there. What you got from the LAFC version was what they wanted to put out there, it seemed, as opposed to what you're getting, which is pretty much everything with uh, Tottenham Hotspur here with uh, the Prime Video version. And to think about the sheer number of cameras and sheer number of data, and I guess that's what you have to call it now instead of tape and interviews and stuff, but everything's on little cards. Think of all of the cameras that they had to install. Think about all of the the information that they had to assimilate to get down to this number of episodes, whereas with the ESPN version in LAFC, it's like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. This is what you have. All or nothing is giving you basically everything. And you get to see behind the scenes things that you wouldn't necessarily have seen otherwise. They they filmed everything, they did everything, and then crafted it into a story. Whereas the LAFC one felt like they had the story and then they shot the footage to match it. Yeah, which is a different a different process. Yeah, and I mean with Hard Knocks, if you think back to each team that's been on uh, the Raiders, they wanted to have John Gruden's return out there as a part yeah. of their as a part of their narrative. The Bengals. Uh, they, for whatever reason, the Bengals wanted to do it. It's like, yeah, let's show Marvin Lewis, not you know, not have, with a v- really good team. Uh, but most of the time, when you look at how Hard Knocks is presented, it's because a team has a plot line that they want to get out there and they want exposure for, and so that's what you get. I mean, yes, there are those elements in there with Hard Knocks where you see the rookie with the good story, the the 53rd guy on the roster fighting on, the time when the Turk comes in, and you see the guys waved and things like that. But uh, all or nothing for me, this go-round, from what we've seen from Prime Video, is the way that as someone who likes documentaries Mm -hmm. and likes the -the behind-the-scenes stuff, that's the example that you want to put out there for a quality product over an episodic period of time. Now, I want to make something clear. Uh, While Chara on on the Twitch pitch is combining a couple of things that was not the original intent. There was a tweet yesterday uh, going around about um, behind-the-scenes content, and it was not a call for an all-or-nothing type of thing. That's All-or-nothing is not a team's social media. It's not a team's digital output. The team's not doing it. Um, is the team working with the people doing it? Absolutely. But it's not what you put on digital. But there was um, talk about Atlanta United's digital team, and I thought it was completely and utterly unfair 
to be perfectly honest. And yeah, I'm biased. Uh, I work with those people on a regular basis. And they've put out work to the point that they have won a ton of awards. Mm -hmm. And everybody has shouted them out for the incredible work that they've done, fans included. I don't know if it's because the results aren't good right now or, or people aren't happy about moves that were made with the roster, which neither one have anything to do with the digital team, by the way. Um, results, <laughs> the digital team is not playing, first off. Um, don't take things out on them. But I thought it was really unfair. Uh, do you, I mean... I don't know if people understand the challenges that, that teams are dealing with right now. You're not having the same access that you normally do. Atlanta United typically would have more people digitally in the press box on the road than some teams had local media. Yeah. And churning out content on a regular basis. You can't do that right now. I don't know why this is hard to understand. You can't. You don't have the people on the ground. You have people in different tiers. You can't have somebody hanging out with the players who are being tested every other day who is not being tested every other day. You're not testing everybody in the club. If somebody wants to cut the check, go ahead. But everybody's losing money right now. So you have to do things differently. We've had to do our countdown to kickoff differently with the team. I've had to do it from home a few times. I've produced it. Because th there's not enough people available who can do all these things in the current way that everybody is doing it. You have to think about, okay, we want to film something at the stadium with Mike and I for mm -hmm. Countdown to Kickoff. Who can come upstairs and interact with us? Because not everybody can. If you are in the tier with the players, you can't come up and see us. Because we're not. You're dealing with things that nobody's ever had to deal with. And we're going to start attacking a group that's won multiple awards for doing this? Come on, y'all. Yeah. Like, seriously. I, I understand right now a lot of people are frustrated and angry about whatever. But stop lashing out at people. Stop taking it out on people. And that's across the board. That's not about just soccer. That's, that's life. Like, look, life is hard right now. Everybody's dealing with things. Being awful to people, trashing people on a regular basis, doesn't make anything better. And it doesn't make, I, I guess maybe it makes you feel better, because I don't know yeah. why else you'd do it. Yeah. But no, I'm not, we're not going to go back and forth on this. But I want to make that clear. You're attacking good people when that stuff comes out. All or nothing is a different conversation, I want, and that also needs to be clear. That's done by a separate crew. That's not a team's digital department doing that. That's not Tottenham's digital department doing it. Doing content, day-to-day -day content right now, is incredibly difficult. Just the logistics of doing it, let alone doing it at a time when no matter what you tweet, people are screaming at you and saying horrible things to the people who are tweeting it. And there are people who are tweeting it. This community, in this game, in this country, it's not even just an Atlanta thing, needs to be better about that. The people who work in this game love the game. The people who are doing anything from communications to photography to video editing to strategy to marketing love the game. So many of them have played. So many of them have given their lives to it. Why are they the ones getting attacked by people who are not doing that? Um, be better. Be better to people. Be better to people in general. If you love the game, you should be thankful that people who love the game are doing that. Because so many times in the past, we saw people who didn't know the game doing those roles. That's not the case anymore. You got people who love the game. You got people who feel it the same way that you do when you're sad about a game after a loss. Because I am. I, am, I said all kinds of things in my car driving home last night. I felt horrible for the players. I felt horrible for Tony Annan. I felt horrible for anybody who follows that team. When 
the team tweets something out after that game, and this is not just last night, this is in general, but when people start yelling at the team account, again, people are behind that. Be better. Dragging things down does not make it better. Trashing things on a regular basis does not make it better. You got constructive criticism to make it better? Put it out there in the right way. Don't attack people. Be better. And it's, it's sad to see with a club that... I, I don't have the list of awards they've won. I don't have the list of awards that Atlanta United's won on and off the field right now in front of me. It's a lot. We have not seen a launch of a club in this country like this. Ever. Ever. LAFC doesn't have an MLS Cup. So ever. Chicago Fire doing it in 1998 is a different conversation. D.C. doing it in the first year of the league. Somebody had to win it. Different era. Right now, you haven't had a team launch in three and a half years, win a league title, win an Open Cup, win an international trophy. Yes, it was one game. It's still an international trophy. Sell two players for league record fees. Spend league record fees on players coming in. Build an academy full out before the first team even launches. The level of commitment and investment and time and energy to build what is Atlanta United right now has never been seen before in this country. And yes, the results right now are not where they need to be. 100%. That doesn't mean that people forgot how to do their jobs. And it doesn't mean that they deserve to be treated in the way that some people are treating them. And people with voices and people with influence and people with whether it's a uh, keyboard or a microphone in front of them. And it's sad to see. And I hope it changes. Um, I don't know. It, it, it does wear on you after a while. And I hope that it gets better. I do. Um, and if I upset some people saying that right now, I'm sorry. I apologize. But I don't apologize for feeling that way. It's, it's frustrating to me because you can't celebrate this club as something special when just the team is winning and then trash it when it's not. And you can't do that with any club in this country. It doesn't matter what level. If the, the Greenville Triumphs start losing, it doesn't mean that they've had a bad launch as a USL League One team. No, it means they're losing games. Sometimes you can play well and lose games. That can happen. Sometimes you cannot play well and win games, and that can happen. Gwen is backing me up on all of it. And Gwen, I don't yeah. need your backup. I got it. I got this. Yeah. But it just is what it is. It wears on you. I'm sorry. That's, that's how I feel. So... Um, I don't know. I got nothing. Um, and I'm not going to get into individuals, and I'm not going to go into it. You guys can have whatever conversation you want. Uh, the negativity has gotten to be way too much. Way too much. I mean, I can't decide if people think that Pitti Martinez was a bum who shouldn't have even been here in the first place, or you should have gotten more money for a player who wasn't good. Like, <laughs> it can't be both. Tiago was sold for $20 million up front. Pitti Martinez was sold for 18 Like, <laughs> I mean, what, what, really? Like, really? Um, I don't know. Now, there, there's some, I guess, who've already decided that this future potential transfer is a problem, which it hasn't even happened yet, and no, it's not. I mean, stop the negativity. It's easy to be negative right now in the world. If, if you feel like you've got to be negative in the world, put the keyboard down. Put the microphone down right now and, and walk away. Um, it's just not worth it. And it's it's dragging a lot of other people into it, and it stinks. So I hope it changes. What's on Twitter to change the subject, por favor? Well, I was going to say, since we're heading toward hour number two, you want me to thank somebody first. Yeah, why don't we do that? Um, because this person is all about the positivity and has done a lot of good things for soccer, not just for us. Um, Steve Apolinski has done a lot to support Inner Atlanta, who is now part of MLS mm-hmm. Next. Um, a lot to support both that club's uh, individual player development growth, but also their coaching growth and just growth overall as a club. So Steve Apolinski's given a lot back to soccer. He's given a lot to us to help us do what we do, and we thank him for it. Apolinski and Associates LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer, comma, soccer down here, and the SDH Network. Wrongful death and serious injury attorneys, Over 30 years of experience, over $40 million for their clients in Georgia and Alabama with their judgments. Once again, wrongful death and serious injury matters. If this is a a conversation that you think you need to have, 
couple different ways that you can do it with Steve Apolinsky and Apolinsky and Associates LLC. You can shoot Steve an email and get it directly to him, S-T-E-V-E at AA-Legal.com. You can go to the website, AA-Legal.com. When you hit enter, the arrow key, depending on the device that you use, that advances the screen. You get the big screen for AA-Legal.com. A pop-up window pops up, low right-hand corner. You can have a conversation right then and there with someone who can answer your questions and guide you on your way, 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Or you can get a free consultation by giving them a call on the telephone. Because that's what they're for. 404-377-9191. Recognized as Legal Elite by Georgia Trend Magazine, top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia for wrongful death and serious injury matters. It is Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. The website is aa-legal.com. You added some extra to that. I think it got your timing off. Well, I was waiting. The music dropped out, and I was trying to hear it in the headphones, and then all of a sudden the music popped back in, and I was like, oh, crap, I'm right there at the edge of the stands, and I'm like, eh. Get it in. I was playing it low. I didn't want it to to get your audio all weird and give you blurry mouth or anything. Yeah, blurry. Yeah, that'd be bad if I was blurry mouth. Yeah, that would definitely be bad. All right. So Nathan Pugh is in this morning, and he had a couple of different points. And the first one was he watched a good chunk of Atlanta United 2 last night. Hearing serious John is so weird. It is weird. Lose that game. Added time. Ugh. It is weird. Um, I think I nearly broke John a couple of times uh, when, well, when, when I, I got I just, away I, from being serious me. I still can't believe that you have never heard of a rooster tail for that, that no. trail of water. Never heard it called a rooster tail. Wow. I don't know where that term originates, but I'd never heard it. Yeah, you were well, you were well, completely distracted. I was like... Oh, uh, I was stunned that you'd never heard well, it. Well, to the point that I was about to be like, okay, do I have to do play-by-play now? Because you were still focused on the rooster tails. I was. I, I just, it's for me, the first place I heard it was Formula One racing because when they Formula race One. in the downpours and all the wet, you see the tires go and the tire creates the momentum onto the surface and it creates that water spray out the back. And they always called them rooster tails. And that's where I picked that up. Oh, I'm, I'm not, and Pacine, I'm not saying it's not a thing. I just said I'd never heard it. And John, like, completely broke character and was was going on about it on the game i'm like hey they're they're attacking go but uh yeah it was uh they got one more we got one more home match uh jason because of conflicts uh will not be at the last home match of the year jessica charman and i will be calling the the match against new york red bulls two at the fraction uh six days from now and then they finish up against uh, the Miami FC for their last regular season game of the year. But it's been fun to see. It's been fun to see the guys develop and see them grow and get the experience. You know, Brendan Lamb got his first start last night, and uh, to see guys like Will Riley, Caleb, you know, Caleb Wiley, see Jackson Conway's game uh, continue to improve. You see Coleman Gannon, uh, his game has evolved over the year. To see a guy like Philip Goodrum, who uh, you know, you see him, like we mentioned in the open, you just see Philip Goodrum all over the place during the span of a match. He's chasing after he's chasing after a ball to try to create a transition opportunity, create a turnover. You know, you see Amir Bashti, who put in a great uh, number of work last night. You see a guy like A.J. Fortune have that moment like he did two games ago where he shoots uh, the absolute rocket to get the goal for the Miami FC. Jack Gurr has had a tremendous season as one of those experienced players yeah, at the has. back from Georgia Gwinnett. Uh, you know, to see all of this evolution that we've seen this year, uh, it's it's been fun to see from game one to game now where they were and now where they are. Yeah, Atlanta United 2 eliminated from playoff contention. Tampa Bay clinched their spot last night with the win. Atlanta was eliminated, I think, with the last loss, if I remember correctly. Yeah, with correctly. the loss, right. Um, you know, it's, it's this weird thing, and I guess the best way because of the setup is to compare it to minor league baseball, like, I don't remember ever hearing or caring about where the the Richmond Braves ranked in the standings in the old International League when the Braves were developing what turned into the the 90s Braves and the great run that they were on. Um, It's kind of the same thing with the two teams. I mean, you want to learn how to win and you want to have better results because that's what each game is graded on. It's the final score. Uh, I think Atlanta United has been better in terms of overall quality this season 
better than we saw in either of the previous two years, and it's been younger, which is a good sign. Um, there's still work to do. You know, you want to develop players who step in at 16 and 17 and can compete with a Sebastian Guanzotti and a Leo Fernandez, guys who are 30 and guys who have been professionals for, you know, 8 to 10 years. That's, that's tough. <laughs> You're talking about 16 and 17-year-olds and some 15-year-olds who have played, you know, a handful of professional games. Uh, Jackson Conway's development continues to impress me. Uh, he is not just a number nine, big number nine target forward who stands up there and you know gets long balls and and plays to others. He's not just that. Um, he was out wide last night. It was really interesting tactically last night to see how uh, Tony Annan had him set up because you had Goodrum and Conway very wide in the buildup. Uh, to the point Conway was putting in a good number of crosses, and it created space for Amir Bashti and at times Coleman Gannon coming through the middle. When they were able to step up and press, they pressed in a 4-2-4 quite often. That was good because they created some opportunities out of it. It was bad because if Tampa broke it, then Tampa had a huge opportunity to run in. That was the risk you took. And it, it was, you know, at times it worked, at times it didn't. This is a young team. You're trying to teach them different ways to play. Uh, to be able to play toe-to-toe with a team like Tampa Bay for as long as you did in the conditions that you did, is an accomplishment. And that's what stinks is you don't get the payoff. You don't get the reward from it. And and that's what's tough. Um, I think ultimately, and Chris Ashley says it's been a blessing for the youth development of the twos having the COVID-19 situation because first-team guys aren't coming down to play and take minutes, which I agree. Yeah. They would get them because it's all all about the first team. Everything at the club is about the first team. Next is the academy. So where it's also benefited is a guy like Jack Gurr, who has been able to play consistently on a USL contract and isn't getting bumped any which way because somebody needs minutes on either side. He's playing regularly and playing really well to the point that he's a mainstay at the moment. And he'll he'll be back with the twos next year, I would think, and potentially an opportunity to impress in preseason with the first team. I think he's played well enough to earn that. He's led the Eastern Conference in chances created. His crossing has been good. His defending has been good. He could be an option for the first team, potentially. Uh, We have to see him against that level of competition. Burns says the best game Atlanta United 2 played all season was against Birmingham. Should have won that one. I'll put the one last night into that conversation because they they went with some different tactics. They were not at full strength even in the Atlanta United 2 sense of full strength right now. You didn't have Mackie Jope. You didn't have Caleb Wiley. You had Matthew Edwards playing left back. You had Brendan Lamb making his debut. You had a Johnny Fortune who's three starts now this season. He um, yeah. had the, the banger on the weekend as a goal, but he has also improved his defense. I mean, his defensive play last night on Leo Fernandez, forcing him back, forcing him back, poking the ball away, earning the foul, that's a mature play from a kid with three starts in USL Championship. Mm-hmm. it's growing. It's, it's good to see players be able to step in and play at that level. So I've been happy overall with the level of play. The results, you want them to get there. That's where your first team guys coming in can help lift it because then you're bringing in you know, established pros who can get you there. And right now you don't have that. And it's tough. I mean, it's tough for the fortunes, the, the lambs, the, the Rileys, the young guys. It's also tough for the, the guys like Mackie Jope and Babakar NJ and, and um, the players at that level and Patrick Nielsen in that group who are coming out of college, Daniel Steedman, Philip Goodrum, who are rookies at the professional level too. You know, like it's tough for them because this is a big jump for them. And you don't have like last year late in the season when the team was getting results – you don't have a Mikey Ambrose in that team on a regular basis. And that was a big help late last season. You don't have Mo Adams stepping in a lot. So, is what it is. Um, DK Branham asks about Eric Lopez and why didn't he get a run out for the twos to just get some minutes. I don't know. Um, that would be a step down in level from where he was at Paraguay uh, in the Paraguayan First Division. The USL Championship is a step down there. Maybe they felt like getting him settled, getting him training with the first team would be better for his development. 
there is still the possibility. Now, I don't know the terms of the loan. That's the only part that is the great unknown here. In terms of just making the roster work, you could add him tomorrow, but then you'd have to create space to add anybody else. Uh, if you're going to add somebody else, which it sounds like you're going to do, then you're going to wait. He's young. He's young. Like, training right now, and I saw this conversation come up about George Campbell and, you know, George Campbell and, and uh, Lawrence Wyke, you know, didn't play a ton this year. Uh, they were signed to first-team deals because they were, they were needed there. I think they've had to stay with the first team because of the protocols back and forth, but also because of the Fernando Meza injury, because of Miles Robinson not appearing to be 100% at times and, and worried that he would have to be spelled. Uh, worried if Anton Walks would be able to deliver the performances he has. I think you had to keep those guys around. I actually think it hurts Wyke more than it hurts Campbell because for Campbell, coming out of the academy, playing a year at Atlanta United 2 last year and playing well, the step up for him in training every day with the first team is a step up. Next year, he has to play games. And maybe that's a little different than where it would have been if he had gotten games both ways this year. Next year, he has to play. And if that means he has to be loaned to a team in another country or another team in this country and not, I don't think, a USL championship team. I think he needs games at, you know, at an MLS level because you can loan young players to other MLS teams um, or to another country. And this is where maybe Aberdeen comes into play. I think George Campbell has to play consistently next year. I think it hurts Wyke more because he's older. And it takes a year further along in his career, not away from him in some ways. I mean, he's training. He's probably a better player right now than he was at the beginning of the year because he's training at a higher level than he's ever trained with better players than he's ever trained with. But now he has to put it into practice. And the older you get, you need those games. I think it hurts Wyke more. Um, and Wyke really impressed me last year. I did not expect what we saw out of Lawrence Wyke. Uh, I thought he was a wild card to get an MLS deal. I'm so happy for him that he did. And he delivered when he came on. He did well. Uh, I think he's got the potential to be a player at that level. I don't know if he's a starter at the MLS level. I think that might be a big reach. But can he be a squad player at the MLS level, play a number of positions? I think he can. He's got a really good right foot. He's got good pace. Um, very aggressive. I, I like his game. I hate that this year has been a year where he hasn't seen the field very much, and I hope he can overcome that, you know, and whatever is, is next for him. But Campbell, you've got to find games for him next year, no matter what. Um, and I hope the training this year has been enough to help him along. Lopez will be fine. Um, Lopez just getting settled this year is, is good. And if he can get settled, continue to train with the first team, um, even if he doesn't play in matches and hit the ground running next year, it can work out. Uh, Jason Nix is in on this side, on the Twitter side, and he says, a great call for the twos last night against Tampa Bay. The boys are so close to getting these results but just can't finish the job. Who's the next guy on the twos? Multiple questions. Who's the next guy on the twos to get a shot in MLS, do you think? Um, It's a good question. I mean... Let's look at the twos and their stats for the year. And I'm mainly looking at who's played the most. Because I want to kind of run through it now that we're down to two games left with Atlanta United 2 this season. Um, And we'll talk about it holistically. We won't talk about it just in a homegrown or not homegrown kind of perspective. We'll we'll talk about uh, who's a fit, who's not. So, Madhu Jadama has played the most minutes for the team so far, 1,260. Uh, he's been really close to the MLS level before. I, I don't think he gets ahead of the center backs that the team has right now. I think he's a great captain and leader for the twos, and I hope he's back with the twos next year. Um, a lot of times, USL deals are one-year deals. Um, I hope Jadama's back. He's a local guy, and, and I hope that he's enjoyed his time here and being close to home. And he enjoys the role that he's in. It's a little bit of the Jack Metcalf role that he had the first two years, where he's the veteran guy who kind of sets the tone for everything. Gurr's next in minutes, and Gurr's been a revelation. Um, I hope he gets an opportunity in preseason to show if he can hang at the MLS level, and then we see where it goes. Uh, if, if he doesn't or he doesn't get that MLS deal then, I hope he's back with the twos. Uh, I don't think there's a right back coming that you're worried about because that's the other thing with the twos is 
And this has happened, and uh, there was a, a great story I read about Barcelona and how they had kind of got their talent production screwed up. You can't hold on to guys at the second team level for a long period of time if you make the decision they're not MLS guys. Um, if you decide, like at Barcelona, if you'd, you'd made the decision they're not a, a first-team player, even if they came to your academy, even if they're a guy that you, you like personally, you can't hold on to a guy out of sentiment because it blocks somebody else. When you have a player coming up who needs those minutes, if you've decided that player's not an MLS player, you've got to move on. Anderson Asayadu, I, I think, is a player who fell into this. And he was different. He was drafted, came in, great story, great personality on the field, maybe a little too aggressive at times. But you had him for half of a year. You made the decision that it wasn't going to be there for him at the MLS level. So you let him go. Go find a club at the championship level where he could play consistently in Birmingham, which was a good fit for him, and allow a player like Will Riley to get those minutes. As the uh, people in the apartment above us are doing, uh, I think they're doing some painting and renovation work. So uh, if it's a little loud, it sounded I sounded like they were dicing and mincing something rather large. No, it's not, I hope they're not doing that on the floor above me. Um, it's a fun day this morning. Uh, but anyway, Will Riley is the next one on the list. Yeah. I think Riley's an MLS talent. I do. I think he's a potential homegrown. Um, you got to make that decision kind of soon because of his age. Uh, I don't know if he is a guy who wants to go to college. Uh, I've kind of got the sense that I think he, he's better than that. It's not a knock on guys who go to college. I think he can get a pro deal now. And if you don't want to do the MLS homegrown deal, do you do the Jackson Conway route and sign him to a USL contract now? That decision's coming up for Riley. I, I think he's worth it. I think Will Riley's a player who can continue to develop and is very, very good. Uh, ben Lungard's next on minutes and goal. Goalkeeper's going to get crowded. Uh, you do have the rumors, as Ricky Ricardo points out, about Novo, potentially as part of this La Nuz deal. Argentine Youth International goalkeeper, he's 18. You've got Vicente Reyes, who is 16. Is that correct? Do I have the right yes. age on him? Yeah. 16, Chilean Youth International. Um, you have Justin Garces, who has been a U.S. Youth International, who you can sign as a homegrown. He's at UCLA. You have, jeez, you have Alec Can. I, sorry, you have Alec Can um, with your first team. You know he's a good number two. You know you have no problems there. You have Brendan Moore, who is twenty four, I think. Can's later in his twenties, so you've got a, a good progression of goalkeepers. Lungard kind of fits into the the Brendan Moore situation. Um, I don't think you keep both. If Novo comes, you might not keep either one. And that's going to be the question because you'll still have Reyes in the academy next year, uh, and he'll get more games after getting his feet wet this year. I mean, he had a bad goal that he gave up last night. Uh, we talked about it all night long. You can't try to catch one in those kind of conditions, and he did, and it gets through his hands, and you give up a goal. And it's one that you hate to see for a goalkeeper. He played really, really well last night. But that's the mistake that will keep goalkeepers from progressing. He's very young. He's going to correct these things. Uh, very highly thought of. Very good with his feet. But that's a mistake. Novo's going to come in and push him. Novo's a couple years older. So I'm, I'm excited to see what the goalkeeper situation can be. I like Lungard. He's different. He's huge. Um, he's very six, vocal. Six. Yeah, he's a, he's a big boy. Uh, I think he's got the ability to be an MLS goalkeeper. I don't know about a starter. And the question then becomes, can Reyes be an MLS starter? He's younger, but I think he can. Ken Novo, we haven't seen him yet, but track record, you would think he could be a first division goalkeeper, a starter. Ken Lungard, you got to make decisions. And that's the hard part about the twos level because you've got to make those decisions. And sometimes you've got to let good players go to create an opportunity for the next one coming through. And that's, that's how it goes. Coleman Gannon is next on the minutes list, uh, a player who we had not seen this year or seen before this year in the academy. Um, I really like him. Byrne mm -hmm. says he doesn't seem to have that finishing knack, and I would agree. I don't think it's an accident that we've started to see him at left back. Um, I don't think it's an accident we've started to see him as a number eight. He's bounced around position-wise. I don't know what his best position is yet. You know, I, I think you see him and you think, and he's probably played it a lot at, at youth teams. Um, 
you see him and you're like, oh, he's a number 10 or he's an attacking player because that's probably where he's, where he's played coming up. The next level, I don't know if he's that. But I don't know where he is yet. You definitely have something to work with there. You definitely have a talent to work with in Coleman Gannon. Um, I think next year it's figuring out where he projects at the next level because I'm not sure yet. But he's got an attitude about him that he, he's got the attitude of a, a first division player. And he's got the ability of a first division player. Can he get there? Um, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. But I like what we've seen from Coleman Gannon in, in a big way. And he made a big mistake last night. It, it was Gannon's mistake at the end that, that cost the team the, the point. Um, he got caught in possession. Um, ball taken off of him by Dalgard and put away. And he's playing left back after he'd played in a more attacking role. He tried to get his way out of trouble because he has very strong confidence, and he didn't, and it cost the team. And he's going to learn from that. But that's what happened. That's why you have to have these guys in these positions. Um, yeah, Burns says, good idea to play him further back. I don't like him on the wing, like his aggressiveness. I'm, I'm almost thinking more as an eight is where I think I'm settling in so far, but I'm not sure yet, and we'll see. And, and we'll see if he... You know, develops a little more physically as well, which could change this conversation in a big way. Philip Goodrum's next on the minutes list, and Goodrum has had a really like under the radar good year. Yeah, uh, I'd love to see him back with with the twos. Um, can he make the jump to the next level? I don't know if he's explosive enough. I'm not 100 percent sure yet, uh, but he's a perfect player for this group right now because he doesn't stop working hard. I would assume from the way he plays, he's a great player to have in training every day because he's not going to let the level dip. Um, he works as hard defensively as he does in the attack. He's a good passer, a uh, really good passer. I love his vision. I'd like to see him with another opportunity to see if he can take a jump next year. Um, I think there could be more to come from Philip Goodrum. Uh, I think it's at the two level next year, but it, maybe after that, we don't know. We could see. Caleb Wiley's next on minutes. For a 15-year-old to get 11 starts in 910 minutes, mm -hmm. that's massive. And, and you got to remember, with players that young, 910 minutes to a 15-year-old at this level feels like about 2,000 yeah. in terms of the mental fatigue and the physical fatigue it takes out on him. And that's why we haven't seen him here lately. He's played a ton of minutes. He's played more than was probably intended. Why? Because he, he, he keeps earning them. He's been that good. Uh, story of the season for me is Caleb Wiley and how good he's been. And I talked about this on the morning show on 92.9 with, with John and Hugh. You know, John ha has been a big fan of George Bellow in recent weeks. Me too. Uh, Bellow has been our man of the match on radio the last three games. Uh, Bellow will play at a big club. Bellow will be a national team left back. Um, I hope he d represents the national team in an Atlanta United kit. Uh, but I think Bello will play at a major club in Europe. I do. I, I think it'll be a major transfer for Atlanta United. He has that ability. And you got Caleb Wiley coming next. Like, that's the thing is great. That's what you want. You create the mm -hmm. pipeline at left back. And, and Wiley would be the next one. He's 15 right now. If Bello has another year or two of development here, Wiley 17, boom. There you go. He's the first team guy. He's a first team guy, and you don't have to rush him because you got Bello there. Keep playing, keep him going, keep him developing. Caleb Wiley is a great one for the future. Uh, Amadou Jope and Abdullah Jope are the next two in minutes played. So Mackey, if Mackey was a little bit younger, man, he would be a guy that you would see develop. I think he still can. He's another one in that Goodrum boat for me. You want him back. I don't know the situation at the academy in terms of the depth chart. And this is where you start to, to sort these things out. Has Mackey shown enough to where you think he can become an MLS player? Because that's the goal. It's not about being a good guy. It's not about being a good player at this level. It's can they play for the first team? If they're still in the academy, they can still be in the academy and say, still got time to grow. If they're on a professional deal with the USL team, they got to show that they can turn into a first-team player or fill a role. Like, I think Madhu Jadama fills a very important role for the second team. Right. Mackey is a guy who wants to play at the highest level he can play. Is that going to be for the first team here? Not yet it's not. Um, in general, is it going to be? I mean, you do have Joseph Martinez there. 
And at times, look, it happens. You know, any attacking number 10 coming up at Barcelona over the last decade wasn't going to play for Barcelona. There's nowhere to go. You see it in baseball all the time, where you have a, a career, you know, legend first baseman. If you're a first baseman coming up in the minors in that club, you know, like, hey, I'm going to have to go elsewhere. And that's the deal. Um, Mackey's one who, he's, he's still raw, but he's got something. I don't think it's MLS level yet. Um, it's not here because of what you have in this team. And if there's an opportunity for him elsewhere where he might get a look at the first team level, I, he should probably take it next year. Um, but he's shown a lot this year, and he's developed. I think he's gotten better as the year's gone on. Abdullah is a player that is interesting to me in terms of that number six. And we haven't seen him consistently. And, and look, we're not seeing training. We don't see training on a regular basis anyway because it's behind closed doors. There's a reason for it. Yeah. But we're not seeing any of that right now. So Abdullah Jope has started seven games, been involved in ten. I've liked what I've seen from him as a number six, but we haven't seen a lot of him. And is that because Riley's been better? could argue that. Um, Riley's younger. I think there's more invested in Will Riley making it, which is the process for these second teams. Abdullah is a USL player, no question. Can he be more than that? He's not yet. Can he turn into it? He's going to need more time to do it. Uh, the one that I'm maybe the, the most impressed with in this category of guys who have come from small colleges who were kind of unknown, looking for a diamond in the rough, is Babakar Injay. Injay. Seven starts, ten matches, 596 minutes, I feel like you constantly see him impacting things. Now, it definitely needs more refinement. But NJ, to me, is a player who you remember after a game. Like, when he came on last night, it was like, yeah, that feels right. You need somebody to come in and knock some people around, cover a ton of ground. You need that lift. And he gave it. I really think he could be the surprise out of this group. Um, and, and that's the thing about this level and everybody looking at it. Like a lot of people are going to see different people that, that jump out to them. You know, I think this guy could make it. I think this guy could make it. Sometimes everybody's wrong. Who knows? NJ's the one who I feel a buzz when he comes into a match. I feel a buzz when he's playing well. And, and I'd like to see him continue to, to grow here and see what he can turn into, because I think he's got the playing personality to fit what Atlanta United wants to be. And he's a different kind of player than what they have. I, I'd like to see him continue. And he's one I'd love to see uh, get an opportunity training with the first team next year, if you can bring him in early and train with the first team before the USL team starts to train. He's one I would do that for. I think he's got that ability. Jackson Conway's next on minutes. Um, he's had injuries. Um, Jackson continues to develop in my opinion and I thought Jackson had a great match last night um, uses his body well now that I think he's grown into it a little bit great feet great passer for his size I think he's a good finisher um, deceptively quick he, he's he's big so you think like I ah, can't be quick but then he, he's past you Conway is on a pro deal so he's not an academy player playing with the twos he's on a USL deal he's not going anywhere now, he's in a position where he's playing behind one of the best goal scorers in league history in Joseph Martinez. Maybe that's why you're seeing him out wide a little bit right now, to see if he can do that and give you a different look. Can he be a player that can play alongside in a front three? Can he be a, a wide kind of target forward? Because we saw last night, Atlanta was, like, the tactic was Jackson Conway out wide to the left, play to him as a target forward out wide to the left. Conway's excellent. Um, I really like his game. And he could be, along with Riley, along with Caleb Wiley, success stories out of this academy. I think Jackson Conway has that for sure. Patrick Nielsen, next. He's had injuries. Um, better and better every time I see him. Better and better. He's technical. He's good on the ball, which I like. And last night felt like the first game that I had seen him play where he was using his, his size, and he has to against Tampa Bay. <laughs> You're going to get run yeah. off the field against Tampa Bay. But he was using his size the right way. He could be a surprise 
He really could. Um, and center back is a spot at the moment where first team, you've got Miles Robinson, you've got Mesa, you've got Walks who can play center back with, along with other positions. You've got Campbell, you've got Wyke. Are all of them going to be back next year? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you want to keep Nielsen around, in my opinion. I think Nielsen could be one that, that maybe takes that step up. He's not there yet. He, he you know, got half of a season. He came in after injuries. But his development has been good. I'd like to see him continue, and I'd like to see if he can turn into an MLS-level center back. The size is a big part of it. I mean, you just don't get a lot of big guys like that that can play. And, and he can play. He, he can play with the ball at his feet. He's a good passer. So I'd like to see Nielsen continue to develop. The reason why I say you keep him around and center back, you're thinking about the overall depth chart, is Garrison Tubbs is in college right now. Um, He's one to to definitely keep an eye on for the future. But he's in college. Kendall Edwards is in college. Those are two that you are monitoring their development. And if they continue to to step forward, they could be homegrown signings. But that's not a definite. And you have Nielsen, you have Jadama, two older players with a good bit of experience, older in the sense that they're in like their mid to early mid twenties. Yeah. That's older around here. But both of them are guys that you want around. And Nielsen's one who I think has room to grow for sure. Um, past that, Amir Bashti has been mostly a weapon off the bench. Got to start last night. Best 90 minutes in an Atlanta United shirt. Easily. Because it was pretty complete. There was one defensive situation with him that I think he, he didn't play well uh, when uh, Ekra rode off the challenge and, and got a dangerous shot opportunity. But Bashti defensively has been a liability at times. He was not last night. Uh, he's always dangerous on the ball. Is he fast enough? Is he quick enough for the next level? That's going to be the question. If he's not, he's going to have to find a way to bridge the gap. And I don't know if he's got that. At this level, he's an impact player. And if he can be better defensively or go to a team that's going to say, we don't want you to worry about defense, we're going to put two guys behind you and you're going to be the number 10 and everything runs through you. He, he's a professional player. And he's a good professional player. And he's a professional player who will have some highlight real moments. Can he get to the next level? Got to continue to be more complete. And he's got to... I don't know if he can do it. I don't know if he can get a little quicker. I don't know if there's anything he can do you know, physically to get there. But that's the question I have. Um, then you're getting into some of the academy guys who we, we've seen slowly this year. Tubbs, um, good to get the minutes that he did. Tubbs is the one who, man, if you had had a normal season, he would have probably played the George Campbell kind of season where he played 20 or so games. And maybe he doesn't go to college at that point. Maybe he shows enough to stay here and get a pro deal. He only got six. Um, It was the right thing for him to go to Wake. Wake's a a good school to go to from a development perspective. Uh, He's not going to dip there. Uh, But maybe he would have gotten a pro deal before he went. Don't know. It didn't happen this year, unfortunately, for him. He only got six games. I want to follow his development a big way scored in his first game, um, a preseason game against Pitt. Matthew Edwards has been with the team. Went back to the academy, came back, and has played left back since Caleb Wiley's played so many minutes. And he's been all right at left back. I didn't expect that. Edwards is one to, to follow. He's just gotten a taste this year of the academy or of the, the USL championship level. Next year's a big year for him in terms of being that next guy in line in the back line. I think it's at center back. But playing out wide, showing he can do that, it's, it's critical right now for these young guys to show they can do a little bit more. Uh, guys who haven't played a ton of minutes, we'll run through them quicker. Uh, Johnny Fortune has been outstanding. Um, limited minutes for him. Great goal, great defensive work out of him. Daniel Steedman, after one year at Virginia, um, struggled to get into the team at times. Um, looked to step off the pace at times. Uh, technical. He's got the technique. I just wonder if he's got the physicality. Uh, Vicente Reyes, a couple of games. I like his long-term development. Efrain Morales is on the homegrown deal. He'll be in with the first team next year. David Mejia is one to follow. Can he get a little better physically to be faster and quicker? And, and he's kind of in that Boshti mold of an impact player, but physically kind of wonder about. Uh, Lamine John A, good speed, 
very raw, uh, and we haven't seen Camden Feo since the the return. I think he had an injury. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have seen him more. Uh, great pace with him, and it just it hasn't worked out for him, unfortunately. That's a quick run through through the twos. I think there's a lot to work with. Um, I think there's three to five guys out of this group with the twos who could play with the first team at some point. Maybe not all next year, but at some point, I think there's three to five right now that I could see playing for the first team, not just signing a homegrown deal and, and getting loaned out, but playing and, and playing key roles. Um, that's a step up from previous years. And I think there's more guys that are closer because of the year they've had. It's been a fun year for the twos. It's been a fun year to watch this team. You know, it's been, you know, gut-wrenching at times because of some of the results and how things have gotten away from them at the end. But in terms of the quality of performances, it's been fun to watch. Rich Ransom follows in with a question. He wonders if Atlanta United has thought about doing a USL League 2 team. And he has the hashtag ATOUTD3 or ATOUTD-U23. Yeah, I think you'd probably go with the U23 tag. Um, I'd love to see it because then you would get – Tubbs and Machoke Chole and, and guys that have gone on to college back in the summer, it'd be a spot for maybe even some of your younger academy guys to play in the summer. Your your 15 and 16 year olds that aren't quite at the championship level. I'd love to see it. It's just down to the commitment and the cost and the logistics to make it work. Um, I would think they could play at the training ground. You'd have to figure yeah. out if you could have people you know come watch or how you would manage that logistically, but. Yeah, I'd love to see it. It's just I think the at the club level, you've got decisions to make about just your day to day looking to get better with your first team and what facilities you have and what you know material you have to work with. You have your second team in place already. We've heard the talk. Um, Arthur Blank gave us the talk on ninety two nine on pregame back against Cincinnati in March that an NWSL team is something they've explored. That's a big logistical thing to put into place. Uh, if that's going to happen, it might put a USL League 2 team further back. A USL League 2 team attached to the academy, I'd, I'd love to see it. You've got a lot of teams nearby, so the travel wouldn't be crazy. With the amount of players you've got coming through the academy, you're going to have some who won't have a place to play with USL Championship, and you'd like to get them some games at a higher level. It could be a really important summer thing. So I'd love to see it eventually, and I would not be surprised to see it at all. I just don't know if it's immediate, because if the NWSL thing is more imminent, and I would assume that the pandemic has affected all of these decisions, yeah, because you've lost money. There's just no way around it. You've lost money. So where you might have been looking to grow, 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 it might be grow. Not three grows, one grow. Yeah. Um, and with more invest. <laughs> Because it's yeah. going to take a minute for that. Lowercase g off. and only one instead of an uppercase g grow. Yeah, I think it's it could be that. So that could slow it down. Um, but I think the NWSL thing could be next. You could see League 2 come in after that. Um, I'd love to see it. Uh, Atlanta United U23 would probably be the way I'd call it. Or ATL UTD U23. There I'm, you go. I'm going to stumble over that all day. Call it, Just call it the U23s. The U two threes, or the U two three, or whatever. Because I mean, it's not Atlanta United two. You call that the U two. You get the U twenty three. It's the U two three. You'd have to say it differently though, because you're saying it like the U two three. Yeah, no. We'll we'll go like the 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 Spanish on this. Um, as you see teams in in like South America where they have a, a sub bente trace. We'll go with okay. the sub bente trace. We'll there do that go. just to throw everybody off. Yes. Sub Bainty Trace. Sub Bainty Trace. Yes, let's do that. All right. Uh, Nathan Pugh is uh, back to his uh, Reds discussion. He says, I know that uh, Jason doesn't quite get slash agree with the signing of Tiago, but if Klopp moves formationally to a 4 one he makes perfect sense in certain matches as new tactics and key passing from midfield. Hashtag less important opinion Thursday thought. No, that's it. it it'll, it'll change the tactics. That's the thing. It'll change the tactics. Um, and, and is that what they want to do? That's my question. That's, that's my question. They have the money to spend. So th- th- no more plucky upstarts. No more hashtag plucky upstarts out of Liverpool. Just went out and got Tiago. You got a good deal. You wouldn't have paid that much last year if you'd wanted to get him. <laughs> you got a good deal. It's good shopping. 
but you're not yeah. plucky upstarts. You're adding a player like Tiago into it. Now, is it going to all work out? We'll have to see. Um, we got some reports out of Italia, and Luis Suarez is in Italy as uh, sitting in an exam as part of his bid to secure an Italian passport. That would allow him to move to Juventus. He... You think, you think he's got? You think he's got a, 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 an IFB in his ear, and folks are giving him the answers to the test? Do you think they're they're cheating on the test, John? What? Why Maybe would you say got, such he's a got, thing? He's got, he's got the answers on a sheet of paper that's hidden in a jacket. What? Why would you say such a thing? What'd so you do? It's a hundred on the exam. Him? It's that important. Why are you accusing? It's not accusing. I'm just wondering out loud. Man. You do what you can to make sure that Luis Suarez gets to Juventus. Therefore, he has to get a passing grade, whatever that passing grade is. Well, the reports are, according to El Mataflow, and um, El Mataflow, I, I trust his sourcing. I'm, I'm double checking really fast. Um, I don't. It's not from at least Adam Digby, who had had the initial thing there. El Mataflow is telling at soccer down here in the Twitch pitch. Maybe it's breaking news from El Mataflow that uh, he apparently passed the exam. Oh, there you go. Uh, El Mataflo later on in the show has given us his official Buzzkill Libertadores juice box picks trademark. <sighs> I have a feeling I'm not going to like this. Um, we'll get into it though in just a second. Uh, okay. Anything else on the Twitters we need to get to? Any other questions on the Twitch pitch? Throw them in now before we go full of Copa Libertadores preview to finish. Yep. Uh, Rich Ransom, another couple of thoughts. He says from yesterday. Uh, MLS was built on owners who were sold on that you could build rosters on cheap salaries and with fancy MLS math, Tam, Gam, etc., and they could win titles. And there's still owners, quietly, mine, who want it to stay that way. That's MLS parity. You know, I- I'm going to give it a little more credit. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full guy most of the time. I'm a sunshine pumper, some say. S- hashtag sunshine That's pumper. what some say. Um, I don't think they were just sold on, on, on that, on just getting cheap players and winning trophies, because what does a trophy mean? I think they were sold on being able to make money. Um, and whether that's making money on the day-to-day, which some clubs are doing, not huge amounts, but some clubs are, are making money, are profitable, and others are not losing a whole lot of money. I think that was one thing they were sold on. I think they were sold on their investment paying off over time, and that's absolutely been accurate. You're seeing sales of franchises be very high, Good return on the investment. So all that's good. I mean, look at Arthur Blank putting, I think, $70 million was the reported expansion fee in. And in the last Forbes valuation, which clubs have sold more for more than these valuations, was $500 million. That's a pretty good return. I think that's what they were sold on. Now, they were also sold on being able to compete. And that's part of it, but not all of it. And I think now what they're being sold on, and, and Philadelphia, Rich's owner, is one who I think is starting to understand this. They're being sold on being able to make money on developing players. And that's a different conversation. And that's an added bonus for some of these guys who maybe didn't really come into it with that idea. And they're going to be able to see that. That Alfonso Davies sale, the Miguel Almaron sale, I think the Pitti Martinez sale as well, is going to start to say, like, hey, you run this well, you're going to be able to put a good team on the field. You're going to be able to be competitive. You're going to be able to sell shirts. You're going to be able to sell tickets. You're going to be able to make money. And then you're going to be able to really make money on selling talent. Hmm. It's, it's heading in the right direction. I'm, I'm good with it. I don't think they were sold on cheap rosters. I think they were sold on being able to make money, get a return on the investment, and be competitive. And you can do all that still and still open up the salary cap and still increase the spending to where you can make the league even better. You can still accomplish all those things. Uh, Rich also says that Philadelphia Union 2 has the rights to U2 with three exclamation points behind it. (laughs) You tried to steal it. Uh, it Steal is such an ugly word. No, you tried to steal it. You absolutely did. Uh, Appropriate? No, you were stealing. Co-use? You can't do that. It's theirs. So you were stealing. You were trying to steal. You were trying to swipe it from the former Bethlehem steal. As you wish. Uh, Kefsi is in this morning. 
a little behind today with power outages last night. We get a chance to talk about the Movement podcast that dropped yesterday. Great interviews with uh, at BPC MLS and Atlanta locals, including President Curtis of Footy Mob. I haven't had a chance to hear it yet. I was preparing for the game yesterday and, and had 92.9 stuff. I will check it out over the next couple of days. Um, very cool to see Atlanta representation in that. So I definitely want to check it out. I've liked uh, Kalen's work on the movement as a, a video documentary that he's done uh, for a few years now. It's, it's great work. It's, it's great stories that people aren't really telling a whole lot in American soccer. So I'm excited to hear this. Nick Brawley, can Joseph return to training if he becomes healthy, even though he can't play in games? Yeah, yeah, he can train. Um, I don't think there's anything against it in terms of the, the CBA. He can't play, but yeah, he can train if he gets to that point. I don't know if you'll, you'll need to risk it. Um, I think he can still accomplish everything that he's accomplishing on the side right now. So I don't think he gets there, but yeah, he could. Just like Eric Lopez is right now part of the roster, but he's training. Officially caught up on Twitter, and I am staring at the Buzzkill Libertadores Juice Box Selections trademark from El Montaflo. All right, make sure you got your uh, your juice boxes ready, too, those numbers, and, and we will get there in a second. Uh, Burned is, is slamming his head to his desk. Uh, Tiago to LFC, um, and Barca is buying Wijnaldum for $30 million. Head to desk. Oh, Barca, Barca, Barca. It's, it's, it's bad times, and it's going to get worse. Uh, four card, how can Atlanta just go into the next matches with just a fresh attitude and not pressure? Would love to see it. That's where you wish you had the fans in the building because that would be a lift. You don't have that. So you have to go with a change of mentality, and it's hard. Um, the one thing that you're going to have that you haven't had lately is rest. You're going to be fresher. No way around it. That will be a big help. Um, it will be a massive help, honestly. Uh, and I think you'll go in with some work done on set pieces, to make sure that you're not having the mistakes that you've had that have hurt you in the last two games and have hurt you all season. Because that's something you can work on in a week of training. And, and hopefully we'll see... I think hopefully we'll see a little bit more dynamic play off the ball to create opportunities. I, I've just felt like... And maybe it's because of the lack of legs and the, and the tired legs and tired minds. That at times when Barco's gone on his dribbling runs, there's been nobody running off of him to give him an opportunity to pass. Um, when when Lennon gets loose down the right side, he looks for a cross, and there hasn't been anybody making the run, or it's one guy making the run. Hopefully, the fresh legs will help that side, and hopefully some work on the training pitch will help that. Just getting away for a couple of days will help with the, the lack of pressure and the fresh attitude, in my opinion. A good week of training, a few days of rest, this team could look really different, but they've got to eliminate the mistakes that could then bring all of it back really fast. Can't concede first. You can't concede off set pieces. That stuff has to be wiped away. You get an early goal, everything changes. Everything, everything changes if you get an early goal. It's that simple. Um, but I think the rest will really help. Uh, newcomer to the Twitch pitch, um, Oyarzabal. Hola. Uh, I believe Oyarzabal is uh, close enough. Uh, thanks for joining us. A mm -hmm. um, lo lot of conversation about promotion relegation in MLS and competitiveness. He said, wouldn't it be better to copy the European League style with different ranks? Th there's, it's such a long conversation, and I know you're having it with a lot of people in the Twitch pitch, which is awesome. So um, we're not going to rehash it here. We've talked about it a, a few different times. The business is so different that I think the U.S. development is you, you can't just say, well, it worked here and they started doing it 100 years ago, so that's what works. Um, I honestly think you're going to start to see the biggest clubs around the world start to pull away from promotion relegation systems. And I know that's going to upset a lot of people. But when you're talking about the money that is involved in it and you hear things like West Ham and the thing affecting their sale price more than anything is the threat of being relegated. And also alongside of it, you see all these lower division teams that are going to be struggling to survive right now. I think the landscape of the, the game around the world is going to change over the next few years and maybe more towards what the U S is doing than the U S changing away. I think those valuations that we talked about in terms of, of franchises from Forbes, it's there because you don't have that threat of relegation. When Atlanta United would sell for more money than West Ham because of that, it tells you something. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to go there. Um, 
you do have to figure out the ways to to push for teams to invest. And I think salary floors and, and finding ways to do that, that can be done. Because you don't want teams to just coast along and an owner just to sell because, hey, I, I, I got my franchise to where I wanted it to get. I'm going to sell. I'm cashing out. I'm good. You don't want that. Promotion relegation helps you know, eliminate those kinds of, of clubs from your, your top division. You've got to find other ways to do that in MLS. But the business is going to drive it more than anything. And the history has driven it to this point because anytime you've tried to grow professional soccer in this country, it had failed before. MLS has been the most successful one, and I don't think it's by accident. I, I think it's because of the structure to a degree. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how the lower divisions go. I think USL will probably have some form of promotion relegation between the championship and League One in the next five years. Um, League One needs to grow a little bit more, get a little bit bigger, a little bit better nationwide footprint. But in five years, I, th- I could see that. I think lower divisions where the the gaps between how much a club spends in – the fourth division or the fifth division or whatever we want to start calling them, you can have promotion relegation there. The gap between the second division and the first in this country right now is a a gigantic chasm that just getting promoted doesn't solve. And a team getting relegated, like why did you invest all of the money you did to buy the franchise? It's, it's That's the problem here is the, the second division isn't competitive with the first right now. Other countries it is. A lot of things have led to that and it's, it's still growing. It's still evolving. You know, the U.S. as a soccer market is a very different place than the rest of the world. It's hard to compare. Um, Katie Weaver says, any fire to the Herrera smoke based on singular quote? Uh, this is a funny one, too. Uh, would he be a fit here besides being fun? He would be a fit here. He is a very tactically malleable manager. He, he's not a guy who would come in and say, I play three five two. He's played everything. Um, he adapts to the talent he has. He, he likes his teams to play on the front foot. He's been at big clubs before, so he's used to that pressure. Um, he would deal with the media exceptionally well, unless you start getting in his face, and then he, he might punch you like he did with yeah. uh, Mexico. You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. So that, that'd be interesting to see. Um, I, I think he'd be a great fit. I really do. Uh, he's not out of a job yet, and let's see. And then we'd have to see what his salary demands were because he's a guy who's accustomed to getting paid very well. But, yeah, he'd be a fascinating one. Um, he's not available yet. And there's nothing to go on just yet other than the fact results haven't been great at Club America. He's on the hot seat. It's always hot, but it's increased in hotness. And we see what happens next. But, yeah, I think he would be a fit here. I think he does have the – being tactically flexible and coming in to a club that is trying to build an identity of a way they want to play, that's a good fit. Because he's not going to come in and say, I want to play this way, no questions asked. He's going to come in and say, I have the players to do this. You want me to play in this kind of rough way? Cool, let's do it. So that's the, the right kind of fit for me. Uh, we'll see. Four card about this weekend. I just want to see it. I want to see Atlanta just play and not think too much. Absolutely. I have zero pressure on them. Just play. At this point, that's what it is. You, you, you want to, and, and this is a tough spot for Steven Glass, because he wants results. You see how much it means to him. Um, but he has to balance that. You know, putting pressure on with not putting pressure on. Because this is a team that, in my opinion, I'm, I'm with four card. He's been, they've been in their own heads at times. Yeah, They need to play freely. They have to do certain things to be able to do that. And that's defending transitions, defending set pieces, not giving up early goals. But they have to play freely. And he's got to find that balance there. Uh, Matiflo, he, he Matiflo is he um, given us his sources. Gazeta dello Sport. He has passed his exam, Luis Suarez. So uh, maybe the Juventus move is back on, and then maybe other moves will start to happen because of this. So Barcelona could be back in business. I still think they're doing bad business, but that's just me. Uh, Clayton Paw says Herrera is the best manager Atlanta United could get realistically as a question. Um, it's hard to say. I mean. I don't, I don't think we can answer that, to be perfectly honest. Uh, he's, he's not available yet, first off. Um, he would be a great get. He'd be a great get for any club in this hemisphere. If he, went to, if he decided, you know what, I want to go work in Argentina, I haven't worked in Argentina, he would be a great hire there. So he'd be a great hire here. Uh, could there be others that are available that are interested? Absolutely. You know, I mean, again, Tata Martino was a surprise to the point that Argentine friends who have worked in the media – that I know, when that rumor started, said, no, there's no way that's true. 
And then they started to ask around, and they're like, well, there's a little something to it, so maybe, maybe so. But wow, Frank DeBoer was a surprise. A lot of people are, will have their opinions, and a lot of people had their opinions when they were hired, when he was hired, and maybe they feel vindicated. I don't know. But Frank DeBoer was a surprise. That was a big name. Miguel Herrera is a, a big name. And it's a different kind of big name because not English language and hasn't worked in Europe. It's a different kind of big name for a lot of people. But Miguel Herrera would be a big name and a big hire. He could be mm-hmm. it, but there could be others. So I, I don't want to say that he's the best they could possibly get. Don't know who else is in the running at this point. Don't know who else is possible. Um, Four Card said, how can we as fans take the pressure off of the team? That's what's hard because you're not in the building. Like This would be one of those games where I think you see great fan bases who, you know, the team is struggling. They try to lift them up. And, you know, they sing those songs of support. And they have those banners of support. And the players feel that support. They also feel the, the anger when, when things are bad. And right now I'm with Four Card. Like, that's not going to accomplish anything. But I can't do that right now. Um, you know, I mean, look, social media is a thing. And if, you know, Franco Escobar showed his frustration earlier this week, show him some love, yep. show Eric Rometty some love. He's on, on social media all the time. Show these players some love who are, are fighting for the shirt and, and are playing hard and trying to fix this, you know, show, show those guys love right now. If that's the, really the best thing you can do because you can't do it in person in the stadium. So, so show these guys some love and, and make them know that they understand that, hey, you know, the support is there for you, even if we can't be with you, literally. Um, Joe Boss, we just got to support the guys. In the last year, we've lost a lot of the on-field veteran presence other than Goose. Integrating all these new guys in this environment has proven to be massive. That's a really good point from Joe. Uh, you know, we don't know what it could have looked like in a normal in- environment. It's not. It's been really hard. You just... He's got to keep rallying behind him. Joe's 100% right. A um, lot of love for Kalen Carr and the work that he does, and I completely agree. Um, I really enjoy his work across the board with MLS Digital. Um, do, 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 do. He was in Atlanta for a while. He quarantined here, so that's where he was part of uh, all the different things. Um, again, back and forth about the structure of Major League Soccer. Great conversation going on. That's a much deeper topic than we have time for because we still got Libertadores to talk about. Yep. Um, Ricky, and I was trying to get to this, uh, can we talk about the potential future matchup of Frank DeBoer and Tata Martino coaching against one another with their national teams? Craziness. Um, we talked about it when when Komen left and went to Barcelona. Who would be the, the best hire that the Netherlands could make right then? Frank DeBoer. He's available. He's been an assistant for the national team. <laughs> People, it's, it's so funny to me because, I mean, the pity stuff was part of this too. Like, Frank DeBoer is probably going to manage the Dutch national team. But he was garbage? Yeah. No, he wasn't garbage. Pitti Martinez was sold for $18 million, But he was garbage? No, yeah. he wasn't garbage. We have to stop saying that things are garbage because we look foolish when people go and buy the garbage for $18 million. And you look foolish when you say this guy, he can't coach. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's dumb. He, he, he's, he's ruined everything. And he's going to go coach the national team that he played for. And see, Gwen's fired up about it. She hates garbage. She, she should be. She hates garbage. But um, Frank DePore is going to be in charge of the Netherlands more than likely. And it makes sense, and it's a good hire. And again, it's not garbage. Like, if we say that everything that came to Atlanta and didn't work 100% the best thing ever and, and win every trophy in front of you and never lose a game, if you don't hit that, that it's garbage, you're setting an unreasonable expectation for every signing, for every player, for everything. And you're never going to hit that. If you trash people who come in and trash people that leave, if you constantly do that, you're lowering yourself because your standard is lower because everything around you is bad. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. I I love the idea of Frank DePore going to manage the Netherlands. Frank hasn't said one bad thing about Atlanta United. His interview with Felipe Cardenas of, of The Athletic, he didn't have anything bad to say. He didn't have an axe to grind. He's not going to do it. 
So why are we, why are, is people still, tra- why are people like, oh, this is the dumbest thing ever? No, it's not. He's available. He's played in World Cups. He's been an assistant in a World Cup final for that program. He won four league titles in that league. He's a good fit. (laughs) It's not the dumb thing. Stop. Stop. If everything is bad, then (laughs) you're setting this expectation that nobody can reach. I'd I'd love to see it. It's it's a wild fun thing for Atlanta United if Tata and Frank go against one another in a friendly here in a few months. That'll be great. I'll enjoy mm-hmm. it. Um it'll be a great match. I'll look forward to the match. So Oi. Oi hoy hoy. Uh Clayton yes. says it's weird because Felipe quoted F D B saying he he didn't want to do national teams. That I think was before the job was open. Um and look, it's a situation where it was unexpected. Because Coleman did a great job with the Netherlands. He had one out, and it was Barcelona. And he had to take it. Because as, as strongly as he feels about the Netherlands, he feels that strongly about Barcelona due to his time. So he took it. So now Frank would not have considered going to manage Bulgaria or you know Slovenia or somebody like that. The Netherlands is one that's going to have a strong pull for him. Ajax would have a strong pull for him. So if they needed him, he would probably go. So it's not something he's seeking out, but they need somebody, and he's available, and it makes sense. And sometimes that's how moves happen. So I don't think he was looking for it, I think. He sees money, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a paycheck, but I think he has that feel for it, too. I mean, he played, he wore that shirt with a lot of pride, um, and he wore the polo shirt with a lot of pride in the 2010 World Cup as an assistant. So if he's needed, he's going to go back. It's like Bruce Arena going back to the national team. And, yeah, it ended in failure. But he left a great job with the LA Galaxy where he could do whatever he wanted pretty much to go back and try to fix it because he felt that pull. If the Netherlands needs Frank in this role, I think he goes, and I think he takes it. And he takes them through a qualifying campaign, and if it goes well, then he goes into a World Cup, and we see what happens. But, yeah, they need him. They need somebody. Um, do 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 do. Alex Piscine, I don't have it in front of me, but remind me, we'll try to get it for tomorrow. Can someone figure out what our record is in each year when the other teams score first, and maybe where that stands in comparison to other teams? Don't know how to look that up. I might be able to compile that from stuff. Uh, I don't remember Atlanta United's record when the other team scores first being demonstrably worse than the rest of the league. It's bad everywhere. The first goal is incredibly vital. Um, I don't remember it standing out as far worse, but I've seen it over and over again in, in media notes, and I'd have to go back and compare. So remind me, give me some time, I'll do some research and see what I can find. Potential growth of League One, and that was something I wanted to touch on with USL quickly. Uh, Jake Edwards was on Sirius XMFC. 15 cities are in the final stages of discussions about joining League One in 21. Three to five is what he's expecting to see. So uh, stay tuned. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, could be some teams in the southeast, potentially. I know they want to fill the middle of the country. That's always a tough one. Um, probably out west as well. But League One's going to grow. It's a good entry point, and when it grows to that point, I think you'll see promotion relegation between the championship and League One. Uh, what we've heard, Portland, Maine, uh, mm-hmm. Des Moines, mm-hmm. uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, uh, the DeMarcus Beasley group. So uh, it'll be it's to hear Jake say that it's it's going to be fun because for me, I like to see the growth of the League One. We saw growth from year one to year two. Now who's interested and who wants to dive in for year three and to, to fill in those geographic holes so travel isn't as uh, big a uh, something to tackle, you know, just so that way you can have the, the more geographic relationships and it's not pack a lunch, a dinner and your hard hat and maybe an overnight bag to go from uh, New England to Tucson for a game. Yeah, you want it to be a little tighter. I think the idea with League One at first was to get as quickly as you could to even more regionalized than the championship. Kind of the old school way of USL, as our people upstairs are in support of this, I guess. 
um, you wanted to get to where it was even more regionalized, so less travel and make it more cost effective. That's going to take time. I mean, if you can get to where the League One has 48 teams, uh, four sections of the country, you play each team in your section twice and maybe have a couple of, of non-sectional games and you're playing about a 30-game schedule, that's pretty good. Yeah. So I think that's where you'd like to get to. But that's going to take time. Um, no, Joe, you're, Joe Boss, you're not being elitist. No, you're not elitist at all. Um, everybody is learning about what it's like to have a team day-to-day that you're following. Um, everybody. People who are, are talking on microphones and writing on websites and writing for outlets – Nobody had a team to follow day in, day out. It's a different conversation than it was following big events, following a national team, following stuff outside of your city. It's a whole different world. Nobody, nobody, I'm not saying you're being elitist at all, Joe. It's not happening. I think at times we lose perspective. Um, What Atlanta United has done is very special. They haven't forgotten how to do it. It's hard to stay on top, even one year, let alone two, let alone two. Three, it's hard. You're going to have ups and downs. You have a key injury like Joseph, you're going to have a down. It's, it's the life of a club. I think at times, instead of understanding and talking about the, the realistic situations that are going on, things just immediately turn negative, and then they turn toxic to where then people start getting attacked. And that's got to stop. That's got to stop. And that's, that's on the community. I mean, I can stand on a on a hill and yell it but it doesn't change anything it's down to how people want to be and want to be about it i'm not gonna change who i am in the way that i function and the way that i talk about the game because of of pressure from whoever or wherever i'm going to tell you what i think i'm going to tell you what i see and yeah i think at times this has gotten toxic and it's sad and i hope that it changes and maybe results will change that i don't know Last year felt kind of toxic at times, too, and the results were pretty good. (laughs) Third place in the league in the regular season and a conference final and a cup trophy and a super cup trophy in the Campiones Cup is a pretty good season for a lot of clubs around the world. It's not toxic. So I I don't know. We'll see. Uh, We'll keep doing what we do, though. That's what we're here for. And right now, we're going to talk about the Copa de Libertadores. Copa Libertadores. I we got a, a sounder. bunch of games in the Copa Libertadores. I'll tell you what I'll be doing today. Um, Te say will be on until 4 o'clock when Racing hosts Nacional. And then it starts the quadruple header of Argentine teams returning to action in the Libertadores. 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Boom. You got games to pick from, too. Um, let's go in chronological order. Four o'clock, Rossing and Nacional. Uh, Nacional from Uruguay has been, I think, the top team in Uruguay. I need to check this really fast. What are the numbers telling us, John? Rossing, plus 118 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Nacional, a plus 235 in your draw, plus 231. Nacional is what? Plus 235. Plus 235. They're playing a team that hasn't played since March. They have lost one time in Uruguay this season. They're 6-1-5. and five. They're one point back. <sighs> it's our boy Sebastian Beccasese, who I, I really like as a manager. But <laughs> you're talking about a team that's been playing games against a team that hasn't been playing games. Nacional comes in off a 2-0 win. A 1-1 draw, a 5-1 win, a 2-1 win, a 2-1 win, a scoreless draw, a 2-0 win, a 3-2 win, a 1-1 draw. They have not lost since the restart. You get plus big numbers on Nacional, you're taking them. Nacional wins. Uh, Mata Flo has that one as a draw. Take a draw, too. Um, a draw would be good for... Uh, Senor Beccasese. Uh, Rossing and Nacional lead the group. They won both of their earlier games. Um, Estudiantes won last night in a bit of a surprise, so they're on three points. Alianza Lima, through three games, has not earned a point. So a draw would be absolutely fine if you're Rossing. And maybe you come in a little defensive here because you haven't played in a long time. All right. 
uh, we'll talk about the other one first, and it's a big one. Sao Paulo hosting River Plate. Uh, what are the numbers telling us about Sao Paulo and River Plate? Sao Paulo plus 139, River Plate plus 198, your draw plus 229. It's in Brazil. Sao Paulo in the Brasileiro is in third place on 18 points. They are 5 2 and 3. They come in after a draw with Santos, a draw with Red Bull Bragantino, a win against Fluminense. They lost to Atletico Mineiro on September 3rd. If River can pull a point, it would be a massive point for them. I think Sao Paulo edges it. As does El Mato Flow. Yeah, I, I'd like to think otherwise. I just I don't think River can pull that one off, not against a team like Sao Paulo. Defensa e Justicia. They there are hosting Delphine. Six o'clock. Um, that will definitely be the game I'm watching out of those two. Sorry, Marcelo Gajardo. I apologize. Defensa needs the three points badly. They lost their first two games in the Libertadores ever, uh, 2-1 in both of them. Delphine got a draw in that round with Olympia. Santos and Olympia drew earlier this week. So Santos leads the group on seven, Olympia on five, Delphine's on one, Defensa is on zero. The top two move on to the knockouts. The third-place team goes into the Copa Sudamericana. The fourth-place team goes home. Defensa finished really strongly under Hernan Crespo. Um, took them a while to get over Becca Sese leaving, a lot of players leaving. This is a club that brings in a lot of guys on loan. They've got like four or five young players from River Plate on loan. One of them they kept on a permanent after last season, uh, center back David Martinez. It's a, it's a small club playing in the Libertadores. Delphine's not a huge club either, but... We're talking about a very small club in Defensa e Justicia. What are the numbers telling us? Defensa minus 154, Delphine plus 434, your draw plus 277. El Mataflo has Defensa. I mean, they haven't played a game since March, and they're that big of a minus number? Now, the reason why is Delphine in Ecuador is in ninth out of 16th. They are four, six, and two. And coming into it, recent performances, they got beat four two by Independiente del Valle. They were up two nil and and got crashed in that one on Sunday. Uh, they did win the match the previous weekend two one. They lost two nil the week before that. Um, one two one before that, lost one nil. So they've been very up and down. <sighs> I'd love to see it. Um, I, I kind of feel draw here. I just – defense has even lost some people since the, the Super League season ended in March. So it's it's a team in flux because it's a small team. I don't know where they've been in terms of training and, and what it looks like. If they get a draw, I'll be happy. If, if Mataflo uh, is correct and they win, poof, I will take it. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. 8 o'clock we've got two, and 10 o'clock we've got two. All right, 8 o'clock, let's go with, I think, the best game of the round, and this is going to be a tough one to decide which one I put my attention to. In uh, Independiente del Valle and Flamingo. Dolme Tarant at Flamingo, formerly NYCFC. Independiente del Valle, one of the top emerging teams in South America. Great developers of talent. So many players have come through that club. Uh, they just had that big 4-2 win, the big comeback. They're hosting here. What are the numbers saying? Independiente plus 190, Flamingo plus 145, and your draw is plus 225. El Mataflo has Flamingo winning it in the first 20 minutes. Wow. Um, you're giving me that big of a number for Independiente Del Valle at home. 4-2 win last time out, 3-1 win last time before that, 2-2 two, two draw, 2-1 two, win. They've been good in their scoring goals. Now, Flamingo started slow under Dome Tarant, but they've been really good ever since. Um, their last few, uh, they did lose 2 0 on Sunday. I haven't looked at that lineup. I wonder if they were resting people. Uh, before that, 2 1 win, 2 1 win, 5 3 win, 1 0 win, 1 1. I think this is going to be a great match. 
I have more faith in the Ecuadorian club than El Montaflo does. Independiente del Valle wins. Wow. Yes. Okay. All right. Give me the juice box on that. Hmm. Okay. All right. Bam. Then, next one. Libertad and Boca Juniors, and maybe the lawyers will battle it out before And that's the game. why I'm watching this one instead, first off, because this could be the shortest match of the round. Well, I don't know how. I mean, I don't know if the, the Boca players were forced to take tests or not. Um, Libertad was like, oh, you're clear. Oh, why don't you take a test here in uh, Paraguay? And Boca's like, no, we don't want to do that. It's like, nah, and man. there are banners hanging up about, ah, oh, you're infected, as, as people were, as Boca was going to their hotel. I mean, it's madness. Um what are the numbers on this? Uh, Libertad is a plus 219. Boca is a plus 120. Your draw is a plus 245. And uh, El Mataflo says it's a draw if it's played. I think it gets played because I think it has to. Um, I think it's a win for Libertad. Because Boca's missing their manager. Russo did not make the trip uh, because he was in the risk group. I don't know if that meant that he had had positive tests and hadn't been cleared, and he's a manager, so they're going to leave him behind. He is older. I don't know if it was because of that. Um, he's not there. That's going to have an effect. They are going to be missing some players. Uh, that's going to have an effect. Libertad has been good so far in Paraguay this season. They are 12-4-3. and three. They're six points behind Cerro Porteño at the top of the table. Um, two no winners on Saturday, five two winners before that, three one winners before that. They haven't lost in their last six, six games. Um, I'm going to go Libertad. I, I really think not playing puts you at a big disadvantage against a team that's been playing since July. So I'm going to go Libertad and, uh, <laughs> El Mataflo, I'm sorry that people are coming in and, and uh, interrupting you listening to the show with a loud volume. Uh, I, I'm i just hopeful about IDV. I am hopeful about them. Um, I watched their last match. I, I like what that team can be. And I just wonder if Flamingo rested people on Sunday for this match. That's the thing I'll have to go back and look at. Uh, but I, I got faith in, in Independiente Del Valle. I do. I got faith in Libertad. Tonight as well. I, I think they, they'll definitely get a draw. Um, man, I want to see this Boca proposed lineup first, but I know they're going to be missing some people. So with all the turmoil, I think Libertad finds a way to win. Two at 10 o'clock. Where do you want to go first? Let's start with Barcelona of Ecuador and Junior. Junior just won the... Super Cup, it's called a Super Liga. It's a cup. It's a it's a two game you know, home and away sort of thing. Uh, they just won that in spectacular fashion over the weekend. Uh, what are the numbers saying? Barcelona plus one seventeen, Junior plus two forty four, your draw plus two twenty seven, and El Mataflo thinks Junior gets a smash and grab. That's what I'm thinking too. Um, I was impressed with them. I've seen both of these teams over the last couple of weeks in, in bits and pieces, and I think Junior is a better team. So I'm going to go with them getting the win on the road. They could be the surprise in, in this round of, of winning away from home. Last one is Guarani and Tigre. Tigre got here by winning the Copa Argentina. They're now in the second division. They, they won that as they were getting relegated. They lost their first two games. They uh, haven't scored. They are a small club to begin with. They're a second division club now. They have been training like everybody else, but come on now. Uh, <laughs> I don't see any way they get a win, but what are the numbers saying on this? Guarani, minus 169. Tigre, a plus 420. Your draw is higher. a plus 323. Uh, El Mataflo says Guarani, and he also says he's watching IDV and Flamingo tonight. And he's got a uh, comment on the twos really quickly. He says also on the twos, it was a gutting strong performance from the defense last night. Good to see the group improving. Also, I'll try to find a gif of Boshti diving in the 87th minute. We lived, we laughed, we learned <laughs> last night. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was a good performance. It was a fun game to call because it was a good performance. It it had a little bit of an edge to it, like it it kept. It, it, it felt like it kept building, so it was a, a fun one. I hope people who watched it enjoyed it as well. 
Uh, Barcelona, a couple bits of news if, if you are looking at the juice boxes on these uh, from our friend El Mataflo because he is now a trusted source. Uh, Barcelona just lost their top goal scorer in the competition. They're trying to figure thing, everything out still. So factor that in to the match with Junior as well. Um, lots of stuff going on today. Uh, I'll be watching Fanatis again. If, you're, if you want to watch all of this madness and, and tweet at me while I'm watching it and probably yelling and screaming about Defensa y Justicia, Fanatis, F-N-T-Z dot C-O slash soccer down here. The trial, you can do a free trial for seven days if you haven't been a subscriber. That benefits the show. You sign up for the free trial, it benefits the show. You convert that to a subscription, it benefits the show. Um, they've been a great partner to us. We love their service. I've been a subscriber for years and years. It's how you I get me in hooked. sports now. John's got it. Other people have got it because of this. Um, fun, fun, fun stuff. And the Libertadores is a blast. Uh, last night's games were wild across the board. You had Universidad Católica 2-0 over Grêmio. You had Palmeiras go to Bolivia 2-1 wins over Bolivar. The Caracas win in Colombia over Independiente Medellín was a huge shock. Uh, Estudiantes Merida over Alianza Lima was a surprise in Venezuela as well. The Venezuelan teams had a night. Uh, go find the highlights of Internacional and America de Cali. It was a late winner for Enter. There was another great goal for Enter. That game was total madness. We'll see if the games today live up to it. We'll see if the lawyering lives up to yeah. it with Libertad and Boca. It's going to be fun stuff. So. Thanks, you guys, for all the conversation this morning. Thanks for being part of the SDH family. We appreciate it. Thanks for spreading the word about what we do. We will be doing it again tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. We'll talk about all the scope of Libertadores. We'll look ahead to Atlanta and Miami on the weekend. Mike Conti, Doug Robertson will be joining us as well. We'll get you set for the whole weekend in MLS. We'll have the run-up tomorrow evening as well. Busy day tomorrow. Busy rest of the day in front of the TV for me and also studying for Miami. I do have some work to do. So y'all have a good one. Tweet at us at Longshoe at OSG Nelson at soccer down here. You can yell at Jared underscore Smith too. He might respond. You can yell at Nick Alifi. He will respond. I know Nick Alifi responds. Oh, yeah. Jared will respond as well. I, I'll give him that credit. He's hanging out in the Twitch pitch this morning as well. So yell at them. Yell at all of us. We'll be watching soccer today. Hope you are as well and hope you have a good day. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.